Hello everybody, it is time for another weekly live stream. We uh, do these streams every week at 2 o'clock, well, really 2.08 Central Time. And uh, this will be the first time that we're bringing someone in for an interview style video. The software I uh, use is Ecamm Live and it allows me now to bring people in, so we're going to try it out. And I figured the best person to try it with first is Humblefish, because he is the fish disease expert as far as I'm concerned, or at least one of them. And I've been pointing people to him forever, and for the last few weeks or months, I've been telling everyone, go to humble.fish, which is his website, and that way you can get help from him. So I have got him here, and he's just waiting. Say hello to all of you. Let me bring him in here, and I'm going to add you on the right side of me. Ha! -ha there you are. <laughs> and your audio. So. Hi, Mark. Good to be here. This is Bobby, but we all call him Humblefish because Bobby's just a weird name. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, uh, fish disease, we actually talked about it probably three, four weeks ago on my channel. And I know nothing about fish disease and people get so upset with me that I won't help them. <laughs> it's like, quit buying fish and you solve the whole problem. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it just seems like I buy some fish and I keep them alive as long as possible. And I, I don't know, I, I pray that nothing goes wrong. And if something does go a little bit wrong, I can't keep an eye on it rather than interacting and, and handling it, which may not be what you would recommend. How, do you, how often do you buy new fish for your own tank? So I'm actually, what I'm doing, I'm in a stage right now where I'm doing a lot of experimentation um, with hydrogen peroxide. So actually what I do is I go to local fish stores in my area and I look purposely for sick, diseased fish. Uh, fish that are showing visible symptoms of ick, velvet, brook, uranema, and then I'm um, giving them hydrogen peroxide baths to to test the efficacy of it and then observing them um, uh, uh, post-treatment to see how successful the baths were. Uh, prior to this, I actually was um, selling quarantine fish. I think we did it for about two years, um, and I was getting in fish from wholesalers and quarantining them and then um, putting them in what I call my retail room to, to sell to the public. And uh, I'm just taking a break from that right now because I want to do more experimentation with hydrogen peroxide. That's what I was wondering. What do you do with all these fish once you keep them all healthy? Now your tank gets more and more full. Yeah, I mean, uh, I usually, <laughs> if I have a fish that makes it successfully makes it through the treatment, I either sell it or give it away. Um, I'm hoping actually uh, next week to go find some black mollies that I need for my uh, observation tank because I use those as canary fish. To um, since they have no uh, immunity to saltwater pathogens, I use those to test the fish to be sure. It's one of the ways to that they're disease free. Um, so that's uh, yeah. I'm kind of in experimentation mode right now, and I'm hoping to. I really want to get to the bottom of what hydrogen peroxide does and does not do, and then yeah, hopefully I can have a DT again. <laughs> yeah. Do you um. Do you have the recipe that you're working with now? Are you already starting to put that together on your website, or is it just way too soon to share any kind of a details when it comes to a, a hydrogen peroxide bath? I assume you're talking about not a dip. So yeah, on my website and on my form. Uh, so there's there's two different ways we're doing this. Um, one is a lot more experimental. I'll just talk about that first. That's giving the fish a high concentration, 150 parts per million, hydrogen peroxide bath for 30 minutes uh, mm. before it well ideally goes into quarantine. Um, and we've already we've already seen that it provides at least temporary relief for uh, velvet and brook, um, but I, I'm just careful to say it's it's a fix for anything until I do a lot more experimentation. Uh, the let me just double check so I'm not giving the wrong information. It, it has to be done in a static bath, so um, you have to oxygenate in the water beforehand, and the fish is in the bath for for 30 minutes. And the concentration is, let me just, I'm pretty sure it's, I just want to be sure I'm absolutely right about this, yeah. is uh, 20 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide you can buy from Walmart or any drugstore per one gallon of salt water. So the 3% um, peroxide we normally get. Yes, yeah. I mean, ideally you would use a product called Peroxade, which is a much higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide, but that's really hard to get for most people. So what I've done is I've, I've, I've got the formulation of just using 3% H2O2 that you can buy from, from Walmart or any yeah. drugstore. And what I really like about it too is, you know, a lot of times it seems when people have disease outbreaks in their DT, it always happens in the middle of the night or on a Sunday when a local fish shop isn't open. You can go to Walmart 24-7, you can buy hydrogen peroxide, 
give fish a hydrogen peroxide bath before putting them into QT and treating with copper as a means of providing uh, temporary relief. The other application we're using for hydrogen peroxide, and it's working out extremely well, um, is doing, um, it's, I call it hybrid tank transfer method. So tank transfer method is a method where you move the fish every three days to a new clean sterile tank for 13 days, but the weakness was it only treated ick. Well, by using the peroxide twice, six days apart, you're treating for ick, velvet, and at least brook. We're not sure about uranema yet, and you're possibly even deworming. So it's meant to be kind of an all-in-one solution for utilizing um, tank transfer method with hydrogen peroxide to eliminate um, most pathogens. In, this, in the study, it's actually backed up by a study where they treated fish with marine velvet disease, and they did hydrogen peroxide baths twice, six days apart in the fish when they did skin scrapes and, and gill scrapes, the fish were completely clean of velvet. So there is like some science behind it, the, yeah. the hydrogen peroxide bath, not just something I just thought of, right? I mean, I didn't really think of it on my own. I just kind of took some information from a peer reviewed study, extrapolated what I could from it and tried to apply it as best I could to, to the aquarium hobby. Right. Okay, now I want, just for me, because I'm being a little bit, there you are, center yourself in the box. <laughs> you're a little bit off screen. Okay. I'm like, I gotta turn your monitor. Uh, see how you're in the middle of the frame now? I'm not How's sure that? what you're seeing on your side, but you look perfect right now. Sometimes you have to tilt your okay. laptop. Um, you, so you actually answered one of the things I was wondering about in the first place. By adding the peroxide, I thought maybe you don't need to oxygenate the water, but you said you do bubble it in advance for 30 minutes, then add the peroxide, because I thought peroxide would add more oxygen to the water. Yes? No? No. Well, um, peroxide doesn't turn back into oxygen until after it's broken down, and that's oh. what you don't want to have happen, because then it loses its, its, its efficacy. So you want to oxygenate the water heavily then you want to discontinue aeration and then it becomes just a static bath. You dose the peroxide in the bath and then you want to very gently stir it. I use like a metal spoon to stir it very gently. You don't want to create any kind of gas exchange or aeration during the peroxide bath because it would then yet yeah, convert it, you know, back to oxygen, which is what you don't want. Right. Um, I also use, I use a glass bowl to do it because you probably can use um, food grade plastic, but um, the the people who originally started doing this were in Australia, and they noticed that when you use cheap plastic, sometimes there was a negative interaction between the peroxide and the plastic, and the uh -huh. fish were acting a little weird during the bath. So, I tell people either use a, a glass bowl or use a, a food you know food grade plastic. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, glass bowl. I almost could picture. I mean, that's the simplest, and there's so many available. And, you know, you were talking about getting mm -hmm. peroxide any time of day, like Walmart. A lot of places carry it. Supermarkets carry it. You know, convenience stores carry it. I remember once I was in a, uh, well, I was on the receiving end of a car accident. And I went to a supermarket in the middle of the night and I was bleeding all over. <laughs> and I walked up oh, to no. the only cashier and I said, where's the first aid? And I went and got my peroxide and my gauze pads and, you know, band-aids. And then as I got out to the car and was about to get in, uh, my friends had picked me up. When I got in, I was like, uh, take me straight to the hospital. And so we did. Right. And I brought my bag from Kroger with all my stuff and said, can you use this? Because I didn't want to pay the hospital rates. <laughs> oh. And the doctor was like, I don't care. And he used my peroxide and my gauze instead of charging me, you know, $20 a peroxide bottle or whatever they do. Right. <laughs> And, it's a long time. and that is the great, that's the great thing about peroxide. I mean, you can get it at any time of the day or night. And it's actually what kind of got me started on it because, you know, I would help people that were, you know, fish disease emergencies. And I'm like, well, you need formalin or you need Ruby Reef Rally. And I'm like, well, my local fish shop doesn't carry that or I can do Amazon, but it's going right. to take two days. And I'm thinking, oh, the fish are going to be in rough shape in two days. Right. So the peroxide is a great alternative because it's cheap and readily available. Yeah. That's that's great. So how far along do you think you are in what you're doing so far to feel like it's a solid thing you can point people to? Or are you still in those early stages? I feel the the hybrid tank transfer method is, is pretty solid. Um, on my forum, there are people that are doing it and they're documenting um, their progress. I have not seen one failure yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't wow. seen one failure where someone says, I ran a fish through hydro, uh, hybrid tank transfer method and then put them in my tank and they had a disease outbreak. Um, we also have on my forum, um, we 
anytime someone uses hydrogen peroxide on a particular species, they're posting it mm -hmm. and they're posting whether or not it was successful or not. And I'm, I've got like a, like a huge thread that's got, you know, broken down by angels, tangs, wrasses, every species and how many times it's been used and if it was successful or not. The vast majority uh, are very successful. They, they handle the bath very well. Um, so I would say hybrid tank tra transfer method is a very viable option right now. As far as determining what a single, because with the hybrid tank transfer method, you're doing two hydrogen peroxide baths spaced six days apart. Mm -hmm. As far as determining what a single hydrogen peroxide bath is capable, is it capable of temporary relief or 100% eradication? That's probably going to take years to, okay. to actually conclusively say that this is what it does and does not do. All right. Well, let me, uh, that was really interesting. Let me kind of go backwards. I think I'm doing the interview in the wrong way. What got you started on trying to figure out all this fish disease in the first place? Because, you know, there are a few books out there, but, uh, and you've got a couple you love, and I'm sure they want to know which books you like. But uh, I was just curious, what got you into this point where you're like, you know, are you killing fish left and right? I mean, what happened? So I've been in the hobby a really long time. I've been in, I'm actually, it sounds ridiculous, but I, I started out in the hobby. I was five years old, a very, mm -hmm. at a very young dad started me out and actually for most of my time in the hobby i didn't quarantine fish i was one of these guys where i just put the fish in the tank i didn't quarantine the fish i mean i had i had my little methods like running a uv sterilizer or feeding really well or whatnot um and it for the most part it worked out fine and this went on for probably 30 years and then my wife and i we lived in london for three years took a break from the hobby came back and of course you know the first thing I had to do was set up a tank and jump back in and i mean i just i just got my my butt handed to me i mean every single fish that i tried to buy and put in my dt died and i had i had ick i had velvet i had flukes i mean everything i tried just failed yeah. and i actually considered leaving the hobby because i'm like i mean how can i fail so badly it's something i've been doing so long so that's kind of when i decided i needed to um I really needed to, to change direction. I needed to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So I just started doing a lot of, um, of course, you know, I read Noga's book, which that's to me like the Bible. Um, Edward Noga has a book about fish diseases. And that's, most people will tell you that's the Bible of fish diseases because he's got every fish disease and every treatment laid out. Um, but then I started doing my own research, like um, getting peer reviewed articles and journals whenever I could, reading them thoroughly. And then kind of like we talked about yesterday, taking what information I could from them and then applying it to the hobby. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of got me going. And I don't know, it, it just turned into an obsession. And I kind of thought to myself, you know, this is a big problem in the hobby. Mm -hmm. And if I'm able, if I'm capable, I want to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And that's just what motivates me. Yeah. And I see a, a problem time. needs to be solved. A long time ago, you... Um... Well, I mean, for a long time, you were on Reef to Reef helping people in your own fish. Well, I don't know if it's your own fish disease forum, but you were definitely in there. And people always re referenced you. They always said, you need to mm -hmm. go talk to Humblefish. And I just kind of kept that in my brain. Like, if someone's got a fish disease, I just sent it straight to you. And that way, you can handle it. Because I, I feel like, like, I had one person sent me a private message. And he said, I got this fish disease problem. And he was really upset with me because I said, I can't help you. I don't know anything about fish disease. You know, go to Humblefish. I mean, that's literally what I told him. And I gave him the link to your website. And then he comes back. And he's like, you don't have any fish. Don't you, you can't just give me a straight answer. And I said, I do have fish. I don't have disease. Talk to Humblefish. He know I'm giving you the absolute best tool I could possibly give you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was just like, well, I just feel like you should be able to take a time out and you know, give me some answers. And I was just like, I got no answers. I know nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ask me about corals. I might have a little bit more information, but I am just not a fish guy, you know. So I, I I, was trying to think how many fish, you know, how frequently I buy fish. And uh, I just bought a batch of fish um, from Live Aquaria last week. And I picked up five, six, seven, eight, ten fish and a pistol shrimp. And mm -hmm. all ten fish are well. The pistol shrimp, not so well. <laughs> it, it didn't make it two days. And so eh, I got to find another one. But uh, the three um, Helfrikis are over here on the side. There's actually two out right now. Very, very timid fish. Every time any kind of whale swims by, they go into the rock. Water. Right. They go and in their rock. Yep. The, the, uh, I keep wanting to say pajamas. The Bengais guys are doing really well. But they are kind of splitting up, and then they come back together. I was hoping they'd actually live in the tentacles of the anemones because that's what you see in the wild. Like they, you know, People keep mm -hmm. saying get an urchin. 
But anyway, those are doing well. And then the two um, gobies that we got, they're, I forget the, what they're called. Of course, I don't. Randall goby, I think. Uh, I think. Mm-hmm. A clownfish apparently attacked one of them and kind of, mm-hmm. or, or several clowns, maybe. I don't know. And so we finally just rescued both of the fish because they were paired. We put them in the little peacemaker so that way they can be in there. And I put a little sand on the bottom just accidentally because it was in the net, which worked out fine for them. And I'm feeding them several times a day. And you had mentioned yesterday to use uh, beta glucan. Yeah, beta glucan is a good. Um, again, it's on my under the vitamin sticky on my form. Uh, it's actually I didn't come up with it. There's a guy named Gary on my form mm-hmm. who did some research, and he actually he calls them he makes fish smoothies using beta glucan. Mm-hmm. And beta glucan is a uh, like a it stimulates the immune system, mm-hmm. which will you know mm-hmm. expedite the healing process. Okay. So in the meantime, I'm watching one fish eats every time, the other one not so much. We've tried a couple different foods so far. Actually, we've tried about three or four different types. And it does eat, but it hates. It doesn't want to eat if I'm looking. <laughs> it's like if I walk away from the tank, then the fish are like, all right, nom, nom, nom. And I was like, oh, okay, at least you're eating some food. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. But for the most part, I just don't really run into these diseases. And I... I when I see sick fish at a fish store, I have even less inclination to buy a fish because I just see it. I'm like, uh, never mind. You know, I just, I have to really see a really healthy specimen. So what would be your recommendations when people are shopping? How do you handle, what are your advice for buying fish to kind of avoid disease? Or are you just saying, just get whatever and treat them with these three medications and you'll have a great fish. What is your thought? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of people are ordering online nowadays and I mean, you kind of get what you get and you just got to roll with it. Um, but I mean, if you live in an area that, that has good local fish stores, I mean, I definitely advocate supporting those local fish stores. Um, and also it's beneficial cause you can, you can go in the store and you can actually look at the fish before buying it. And I tell people, um, the fish, the fish should basically look flawless. I mean, the fish should look, I mean, perfect. There shouldn't be any blemishes, obviously no white spots. There should be no ripped fins. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is an advantage of, um, of buying from a local fish store. You can actually um, ask to see the fish eat. So you can ask the owner or one of the employees to feed the fish, and you can see the fish eat prior to buying, and make sure you leave the store with whatever they, they fed that yeah. fish. Um, if a fish is not eating, I wouldn't buy it because then there's no guarantees if it's not eating in the store that it's going to eat in quarantine or, or in your display tank. Um, I would also say that, so you, you can look at the fish, you can see if the fish is eating. Um, you can actually, I mean, depending how close you live, you know, maybe there's a fish that's not eating, maybe you could go back in a day or two and try again. Um, so you just kind of have that. Um, a little trick that, and it's a little weird, but it's easier to do nowadays with cell phones. You actually, if you can get the fish to actually come close enough um, to the glass, which some will do, you can actually use the magnifier on your cell phone and you can use that to kind of look at the fish and you can actually sometimes see things like trophons starting up or blemishes on the fish you otherwise would not see. So that's That's a little thing you can do. (laughs) I have not seen Mm -hmm. anyone do it, but I like that idea. I usually will say, oh, that thing's cool when I start filming or taking pictures. I never thought about using the magnifier. That's a really good idea. Yeah, you know, back in the old days, you would go in there with a magnifying glass and you could actually like look at the fish. But, you know, nowadays with cell phones, you could just use your cell phone to do it. Yeah. Okay. And or um, you can even take pictures of the uh-huh. fish and sometimes examine, like zoom in with your, your camera and just kind of maybe see things that may look questionable to you before buying the fish. Right. Yeah. That's when you're, <laughs> that's when the whole store realizes how OCD you are. You show up, can I clean the glass? <laughs> I'm trying to get some really right. good video of this fish I may buy. No, that's good. I like that tip. That's a good one. And you mentioned about making sure it can eat. And I liked where you said, come back in a couple of days and try again, you know, in, mm-hmm. instead of just trying to impulsively buy it that day. All right. Right. Um, and then once they get the fish, you're, you're a high, a strong proponent for getting a quarantine tank set up and moving into that next. Yes. I mean, even, you know, I know it's a controversial subject about whether to use medications or not, but I feel it's it, even if all you're going to do is just observe the fish, mm-hmm. meaning, I mean, you can set up a miniature version of your display tank. I mean, you can even have corals in there if you want, and you can just put the fish in a smaller tank and observe the fish. You don't have to necessarily use medications. And, you know, so that way my my train of thought is 
the fish, if it does die, it dies in there and doesn't die in your display tank and possibly, you know, contaminate your other fish. Right. Um, cause a lot of people, you know, they argue about, oh, you shouldn't use copper. You shouldn't use harsh chemicals on fish. And I mean, there's definitely an argument to be made there, but you still, I feel can set up a quarantine tank and just passively observe the fish for maybe a couple of weeks before you place the fish in your display tank. It's also a good time to, you know, sometimes fish we buy or we get, um, are a little thin, Maybe they need to be bulked up. Maybe they need to be basically babied before they get put in your your DT with fish that are going to be aggressive towards them. So it's a great opportunity to feed them multiple times per day, feed them nori. I mean, just kind of build up their immune system and build up their strength before placing them in your display tank. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, so yourself personally, how long do you keep a tank in, a fish in quarantine observing before it goes in your tank? You said a couple of weeks, but I feel like you might be longer than that. So, I mean, personally, I mean, I, I do a more aggressive um, quarantine. So any fish I buy is going to get a hydrogen peroxide bath before it ever enters my quarantine tank. Um, and then I'm going to treat with copper. Um, I was treating more with chloroquine, but I mean, that's very difficult to find right now after everything that's happened with that drug. So I treat with copper. I use copper power with a uh, HANA, the high range copper color meter for, for testing. And I treat it 2.5 ppm for two weeks. During that time, um, I use a medication called API General Cure, which contains Prazi and Metro in one medication. It does two things. The Prazi deworms. So if the fish has flukes or tubularians, anything like that, it will take care of the worms. And the Metro component treats for broken uranema, which copper does not treat. Copper only treats ick and velvet. So in order to treat broken uranema, you have to treat with Metro. And then what I actually do is I transfer the fish. Um, I treat them for two weeks with intense, intensive medications. And then I transfer the fish into the observation tank okay, and so I watch tank. the fish for yeah, second tank. So I think about a, you know, bare bottom, uh, treatment tank. And then a second tank that I transfer the fish into after two weeks, that's, um, 10 feet away for aerosol transmission that I observe the fish for about 30 days. And I also use black mollies, um, because so if you go to any fish store and you buy freshwater black mollies and you slowly convert them over to salt water, black mollies have no resistance or immunity to salt water pathogens. Okay. So what you can do is sort of use them as sort of a canary fish to, so you're watching your fish, but you're also watching the black mollies to see if you're seeing any, you know, white dots or growths or anything, which yeah. shows you that probably the fish that are in observation have a disease because they've shared it with the mollies. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, good. And that's what I do. Okay, so my brain is thinking people are listening and some are getting motivated. I really want to start being like Bobby. <laughs> you know, I want to do this. So what should they buy for their medicine cabinet for the aquarium now so that they're prepared for upcoming fish? What would you recommend? Um, so, would, so the first thing you want, I mean, is a bottle of copper. So I use copper power. You also want to buy the HANA, the high range um, color meter, um, which is, is and has it's very accurate for testing your copper level because you don't want to just rely upon the dosing instructions. You want to actually test the copper level ideally on a daily basis to be sure it's the copper level is not fluctuating. Um, I use API General Cure for deworming. I would also have a bottle of Prozzi Pro on hand because it does have a higher concentration of, of, of Prozzi. Sometimes I've, I've had uh, times when general cure has not worked for deworming. and I've had to use Prozzi, so it's good to have that as a backup. Um, and I think the other thing, I medications I would have on hand, and they're also by CCHEM. Uh, CCHEM makes a medication called Canaplex, which is a good wide-spectrum antibiotic on the off chance you, the fish has a bacterial infection. And I would also have um, um, CCHEM Metroplex, which is pure metro, um, and also CCHEM Focus. And what CCHEM Focus does, it's a food binder, and it allows you to take medications like um, General Cure or Metro or, or Canaplex, and you can then use CCHEM Focus to um, food soak the medication if you suspect the fish has internal pathogens. But I mean, I'm not saying to use all those medications. I'm just saying to have them on standby all in case. But the main ones I would use would be Copper Power and API General Cure are the two ones you want to use. All right, so let's say we've got all that in our possession, and then you 
acquire a new fish and you start to go through the process, whether it's just the observation with the medications that uh, avoid or that help get the worms out, like you said earlier, the prosy, and you're using the foods that they sold you from the fish store or you're using your own foods trying to train it, and then you see the outbreak. Do you still treat in that tank or do you have to move to a totally different tank? You know, Because this is the observation tank or should it really be they're already in the hospital tank and we're going to see what happens next? Are you asking like if I'm seeing the symptoms in the quarantine tank or observation tank? Well, that was what I was saying. So, you know, I buy a new fish, I come home, I've got this arsenal of medications and foods, and then okay. I put it into a tank, but not my reef. So should I have put it in my official quarantine tank or my official medication tank, or can I just put it in the observation tank? You know, what would you, where should it go first? Because what if it breaks out in seven days? Then I got to move it again and stress it again. So, I mean, what you could do, so I guess it depends approach you're taking um if you're going to go with just the observational approach then i would put the fish in the observation tank okay. and then just have the quarantine tank on standby right. um so basically you're just what you, you so the the point of observational quarantine is just to watch for any diseases without applying any medications right so you have the observation tank and you know depending on what you're seeing like okay so for example if you're seeing um ick or velvet we'll just say well, that's something you would want to move the fish into the um, into the quarantine tank and you would want to treat with copper in there because you're probably going to have rock and sand in the observation tank and those are going to absorb copper. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to use that there. However, let's just say you were to see like the you're not seeing any um, physical symptoms like, you know, ick or velvet. But let's just see you're seeing symptoms of intestinal worms, which is uh, the fish is losing weight. The fish has a pinched stomach and the fish is producing white stringy feces. Well, that is something you could actually treat for right in the observational tank because you're not actually dosing the water with medications. You're going to be food soaking medications to, right. to deal with that. So it kind of depends on that. Now, if you're going to go the other route and you're going to say, well, I'm just going to treat the fish with, with copper and general cure and then observe, then you would want to first treat in the quarantine tank, move to the observation tank, and if treatment failed, then you have to move the fish back into the quarantine tank. And unfortunately, with an observation tank, if let's just say ick or velvet slip through the observation tank, you're now looking at a fallow period of about six weeks right. to render that tank safe to be a, yeah. an observation tank again. Yeah. So yeah, it, can yeah. get, like, it can get tricky, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? So. And, and something else I wanted to say. No, go ahead. No, keep going. Well, well, it's something else I wanted to say, and it's actually something I was actually thinking about this morning, is I, I think, you know, there's a lot of controversy about whether to quarantine. I mean, some people want to quarantine, some people don't quarantine. And I think, I, I'm, I guess my views are evolving to the point that I think what is the most important thing is that you have a plan. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying by that is, you know, if you choose to quarantine, obviously have a, a, a quarantine regimen worked out. But if you choose not to quarantine, if you're just saying, look, I'm not going to quarantine, that's not for me, I'm just going to put the fish right in my DT, then what I would say to that is at least, like, understand that by doing that, you're probably going to get uh, fish diseases in your DT. Yeah. So f don't wait until it, it happens, formulate a, a plan to deal with it. Like, I know I've seen some of yours before, and like, you're a big proponent of um, safety, safety stop. stop. Mm -hmm. So you've got a plan. You're like, well, I'm, I'm going to use safety stop before the fish go into my DT. Some people um, will use a UV sterilizer. Some people use a diatom filter. Some people will use an oxidator. There, there's a lot of disease management tools mm -hmm. that you can use in a DT. And I would just recommend to have that in place from day one mm -hmm. and have a plan in place for dealing with it. Don't wait until okay, I put all these fish in my tank and they're all covered in white spots. What do I do? Yeah, so, buy a UV, hook it up, squish the right, fish right. UV. Because <laughs> by then it's too late. I mean, once, once yeah. you actually have an active outbreak, it's yeah. usually too late to rein it in with a management tool where if you have a management tool or some kind of a, a protocol in place from day one, then you've got a game plan. Like if you're running a UV sterilizer from day one or a diatom filter from day one, then at least you have a tool in your tank that is siphoning out the free swimmers and killing the free swimmers. Mm -hmm. So you're keeping the pathogens you hope at a, at a sublethal concentration, because the thing that 
that people sometimes I feel failed to fail to realize the reason that these fish don't have these, these horrible outbreaks in the ocean is because they have dilution on their side. Mm -hmm. There's a gazillion gallons of water in the ocean that are diluting the parasites from the fish. And the reason that it fails sometimes in our tanks is, I mean, our glass boxes are relatively small in comparison. Yeah. So you have to try to replicate that. You have to try to replicate dilution um, with, with a management tool. And I'm also a huge proponent of no matter what you do, you need to feed well. Mm -hmm. um, you need to feed fit, uh, foods that are live foods, foods that have live bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think flakes and pellets are fine for the occasional feeding, but I think that the primary diet should be, you know, clams, mussels. Um, I'm a big proponent of LRS foods. I mean, I know Rod's foods are, are very good as well, mm -hmm. but these are actually like seafood that contains live bacteria that will um, actually your gut flora and their immune system, the fish that will actually help enhance it. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of that, you know, because I've tried several different foods and uh, I, I use uh, Rod's food and I use mices and PE mices and I also use Benarif and I've also used Live Rock Enhance. And mm -hmm. the, a lot of the end, uh, you know, Benarif and Live Rock Enhance both have a bacteria in them. And when you pour either in the tank, the fish eat it. And I was thinking, mm -hmm. well, you're getting the bacteria inside the belly of the fish. That's got to be helpful, you know, to yep. kind of replenish what they may be low on. Yeah, because the way the fish's immune system works is it's it's the, the gut microbiota, the gut flora. And that is what releases, I mean, I have like releases the proteins into the mucus coat, which actually fights off the pathogens. Mm -hmm. So you have to mm -hmm. kind of um, nurture that. So um, using, you know, foods that contain live bacteria, frozen foods or supplements that contain bacteria, using vitamin supplements, for back beta glucan. These are all things that are uh, that, that will stimulate the immune system. These are things that will nurture or, you know, help flourish the fishes, you know, the, the gut flora. And, and that's something that really every if you have fish, everyone should be doing regardless if you quarantine, you don't quarantine. It really should be day one whether the fish are going into quarantine or into your dt it just is it's a good strategy you know it's interesting you've said that because now it makes me think i don't think anyone ever cares about what goes in the fish's belly i mean we might say we do but i don't think we really do we buy something mm -hmm. the fish likes it we just stick with it and it's working right. but when you own a dog and you buy whatever brand of dog food you get you know just the first thing and then you start doing research and you're like, oh, this one is way better. It's got less fat in it or it's got more of this. And you start, you're like, well, I'm going to buy this high dollar uh, dog food because I feel it's going to really benefit my dog's fur coat and you know, teeth and eyes and everything, right? But I don't know that hobbyists for the most part do that with their fish. I think it's more like, oh, I like this brand <laughs> rather than thinking right. like you just said, this is going to benefit their gut. And that's actually a huge mm -hmm. discussion that... I don't remember hearing discussed all that much in my circles, you know? Right. Oh, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's one of the most overlooked things. And I mean, and I'm not saying, look, we all, we get in a rush, we go on vacations. I mean, sometimes you have to feed flake or pellets or whatever, because it's just quick and easy, but I just feel like the fish's primary diet um, should be basically frozen seafood, um, live foods. I mean, there's, there's live black worms. Yeah. You can do uh, a live white worm culture, which the fish mm -hmm. eat very well. Um, you know, there's obviously you can, you know, brine shrimp aren't the most nutritious, but, you know, it's every now and then to do like a live brine shrimp culture mm -hmm. um, to do that. I mean, and like, you know, if you live in a, in a coastal area where you can, you have access to fresh seafood, there's, there's clams, there's mussels, there's oysters, um, there's scallops. There's so many, you know, there's right. recipes out there. You can make your own frozen food if you want. And, and I feel that's crucial. That's, that's just absolutely crucial, especially it's crucial for all fish, but especially if you're not going to quarantine and you're going to roll the dice, I just feel like you should, you should do everything you can to enhance the fish's immune system. And, and that, that is one of the most important things. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you a myth or a fact. Um, you okay. talked about using a UV earlier and you said you use it from the very beginning. I have heard in the past, a million years ago in passing, that if you hook up a UV to a tank from the beginning and the fish rely on it to basically keep them safe, that when your e UV dies, that your fish are just going to break out and whatever. Is that true or false? Very, it's very possible. I've seen it happen many, many times um, because so what the UV sterilizer is doing is it's it's 
so like it and velvet for example have a tomone stage which is like their egg stage and then they release free swimmers in the water mm -hmm. so the free swimmers are kind of floating through the water propelling themselves and they're looking for a fish host to mm -hmm. to, to feed upon so the theory of a uv and it works is that the um the uv siphons out some of the free swimmers, it usually doesn't get them all, doesn't yeah. usually get 100%, it siphons out, we'll just say most of the free swimmers, it passes through the UV light, UV light kills the free swimmers mm -hmm. and renders them inert. Um, so, but the, the like I said, the, the problem is that usually you're not gonna get 100%, even if there's just a few that, that latch onto the fish, they're gonna continue the life cycle. So when the UV suddenly goes down, you've, mm -hmm. you've essentially lowered the shield that you had in, in your tank. And when the UV goes down, then it allows what it was a small concentration of parasites in your tank to reproduce and might take a couple of weeks or even a month or two, but then you're gonna have this, this large concentration, overwhelming concentration of parasites, which are gonna attack your fish and possibly overwhelm their immune system. Okay, all right, fair enough. So I guess it was true then. <laughs> I um, yeah. wanna know how often would you change the bulb on a UV? in your recommendation every six months okay that's what yeah I'm to, to keep it at peak performance every six months you need to change the lamp all right and how do you know if the lamp is still good i mean how do you know <laughs> with yours with i mean yours? i there's no way of really like visibly telling i mean every manufacturer is going to have their recommendation mm -hmm. um and maybe i mean possibly there's some uvs out nowadays that um that the lamp is is effective for more than six months, but most of the no. brands I've seen. I just meant like, you know, physically, like, like we look at a power head, we can see water coming out and we might see some bubbles with mm. the UV. How do you know if your bulb is burned out? For example, is there like a little, cause I don't run a UV. I've never owned one, but I, do they have like a little window mm. or something to see a little glow? So you know, it's working. I think, you know, I mean, honestly, I've not run a UV. I have a UV. I haven't run one in many, many years. Okay. Um, because I just don't feel like I need to, but um, I, the ones that I've used in the past, actually, which you have to kind of do, like there's usually like a little, like you don't see, because the, the tube itself is, is you can't see through it, yeah, but you can see the light emitted from, from the tubing, if the tubing's clear. So what you have to do to be sure that it's still working, that everything has to be completely dark and you should see the UV light being emitted from where the tubing is hooked into the to the housing oh, okay, itself. Okay, from the ends. You'd see some glow coming out of the end. Exactly. Okay, all right. Yes. Okay. Just curious, because like we were saying, if it's not on or if it's not working and and you're not doing any good, you've got right. this nice safety and it's really doing nothing. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. OK, so I want to ask you, there's probably this master list on your website. <laughs> I mean, I know there's stuff on there. I've been on your website three, four or five times. But I didn't memorize it. Is there a list of any species of fish that cannot be in copper? Is there something that's not copper, say, like a mandarin, for example? Is that dangerous to a mandarin that the oily? Aspect? Right. There's fish, there, there's two classifications. There's fish that are copper sensitive, where you can treat them with copper, but with caution. Um, mm -hmm. Rasses, all rasses pretty much fall into that classification. They seem they, they seem to be sensitive to pretty much all medications. Okay. So anytime mm -hmm. you, you prophylactically treat a ras with any medication, uh, you know, that can get a little, a little dicey. You have to be really careful. Um, rasses don't tolerate copper well. There's this thing about angelfish. Some people say that angelfish are copper sensitive, and I've kind of seen evidence of that, but then I've seen evidence where it's not true, so I'm not really sure um, if that's a thing or not. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's some others. Um, puffers are supposed to be, but they're so hardy that they, it's weird. Puffers tolerate um, like copper power, but they don't tolerate cupramine well, which is ionic copper. So for some reason, copper, you know, puffers seem to tolerate that one version of copper better than the other. Um, there's a whole list of fish that you can't treat with copper at all. Um, any fish that is um, um, scaleless, um, you cannot use copper on, you know, sharks, rays, eels, uh, mandarins are one that sometimes they do, but most of the times they're not gonna tolerate copper. Seahorses, pipefish, they don't lionfish. They don't tolerate copper at all. Gotcha. So then you all have right. to use an alternative treatment, which was what chloroquine was so great for because it was that alternative treatment, and now it's off the market. Yeah. 
All right, let's answer good. some questions here in the live chat, but I'm going to throw one on here that we got uh, sent to me privately in a message. I'll put it on the screen here. And uh, this person was saying, I'll put it down here, I guess. I'm trying to put it in a spot where we can both see it. Uh, it said, ask him what he thinks is the best copper treatment for the majority of marine fish. And what are your thoughts on safety stuff? What do you think of it? And what's the best? Well, that's pretty much what we've been talking about. <laughs> I just didn't want to ignore Steve's question, so I want to throw it up here. Uh, he did say, what do you do if you can't get the fish out or after a quarantine has failed? So that's kind of an all-encompassing question, but I think we can kind of dive into it. So copper power, um, is this what I use? I use copper power with coupled with the uh, HANA um, high-range color meter. Um, it's the, the HANA meter is accurate within 0 0.05 ppm. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a pretty, you know, accurate reading when you test your copper level. Um, so safety stop based on what I've read about it, um, it should be an effective treatment for a lot of pathogens. So my understanding is that the first component is formalin mm -hmm. and the other component is methylene blue. Yes. So Formalin is highly effective at removing what I call surface parasites. Yes. This would be parasites yeah. like uh, velvet, um, brook, uh, flukes. I don't know how effective it actually is against ick because ick, the trophons actually burrow um, under the outer skin layer. Right. They, they burrow deeper into the dermis of the fish. So I don't know if formalin is capable of, of killing those trophons on the fish, mm -hmm. um, but it's highly effective against a, a wide range of um, diseases. Um, I have some concerns about using formalin because it is a known carcinogen. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some experimentation. It's banned in certain countries because it is a, uh, a cancer-causing agent. So, I mean, I would highly recommend anyone that fools with formalin to use, you know, rubber gloves, face mask, yards, protect yourself from the fumes and from the chemical itself. Right. Um, and methylene blue actually is very good uh, for healing wounds. Um, it is um, a very good, has, a, has some antibacterial activity to it if the fish has a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. My only issue with Safety Stop is I would like to know more about the product. I've reached out to them by email and I've not received a reply. I would just like to get more, like I can get behind any product if I can understand the science behind it. And if I understood better, like what percentage of formaldehyde is in the in their formalin? Like what percentage of methanol is in their form, in the product? what percentage of methylene blue, if I can actually see the, the data yeah. and get some hard numbers that, that I can then go research, then I just feel more comfortable promoting a product when I can, yeah. I can do that and analyze the product. Yeah. All I can do is yeah. say I've put a lot of fish through it in the last 10 years. <laughs> because I, I mean, mean, it sounds like it, it should work. I mean, I mean, if, yeah. if, if half of it is formalin and the other components methylene blue, I mean, you're, you're wiping out a large percent of the pathogens before they ever enter your, your display tank. I mean, the only one I would be worried about would be ick, but I mean, ick is for the most part, it's a, a manageable disease to, to a DT. And I believe that one is stated on the packet. Like if the fish has ick, don't put it in safety stuff. I think that's one of their actual okay. uh, recommendations if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, I put all the 11 skunk clownfish through it. I put the 14 uh, oscillaris through it. Um, I put mm. all the new fish I just got last week. Those 10 went through it. Um, the copper band's been through it. The yellow tanks have been through it. Rasses have been through it. Um, just fish. That's the only thing. Right. Some people want, well, can I put a coral? Can I put an invert? No, it's for fish. Yeah, fish only. And it's well, only me, external parasites. It doesn't help with anything internal like you were saying. So right. Well, let me ask you how, how long has your tank been set up? How long has your DT been set up? Uh, this just turned seven. Seven years. Seven years. So I kind of have a theory and I don't know if this is, I haven't been able to prove it, but so, and the reason I, I wonder about this is because when I was communicating with one of the scientists that actually did the, um, the study, which previously established a 76 day rule, he said one of the reasons they were able to propagate a strain of ick that long was they use antibiotics. And the reason they use antibiotics in the sterile flask was because he suggested that if parasite tomons were in a display tank or, or in a natural environment, bacteria would gnaw on and damage the tomons. So I have a theory that the reason we see so many disease outbreaks in younger tanks, as opposed to like, you know, older, more established tanks like yourself, is I think enough time has developed in your tank for, for 
bacteria, strains of bacteria and other microfauna to cultivate in your tank to actually serve as predators of parasites. Okay. Yep. You know, and there's even a theory out there, and I haven't really seen any evidence to back it up, that maybe even corals, maybe even since corals are filter feeders, could corals, certain corals uh, be um, like eating free swimmers, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in more mature aquariums, one of the reasons it's possible that you don't see as many disease problems is because you have like natural predators already built into your tank already whereas yeah. people just starting you know a brand new tank very little bacteria maybe some coral frags they don't have those natural defenses built in i mean it's a theory and i've been searching and searching for evidence yeah. to to prove it and i haven't been able to yet but it, it kind of makes kinda logical, sense in a way because every mm -hmm. ecosystem has an entire check and balance system in place and then when we and i've been complaining about this for a while now when people set up a brand new tank and they have no live bacteria they have no live rock they have no live sand they just i don't want to get a pest in my tank that's their that's all right. they care about it's like i'm gonna build a brand new house and i don't want any ants in my house you know <laughs> if they're gonna get in it's gonna happen i don't know but i'm not saying well, just throw anything in and see what happens but i've been a live rock guy and i i've bought bags and bags of live sand which costs more because i believe right. and i've seen what happens when i put it in the tank i watch things burst out into life all over the glass within a couple of days right i know there's stuff in it it's not a myth it's not a uh, way to rip people off but you know people are like i said they're very cautious about the pests where i've never really been scared of anything that got in my tank i just dealt with it and for me it's usually well, a coral thing not the fish thing and, and you've been in the hobby long enough where you probably remember back in the 80s where in the or 90s when reef tanks were more of a thing everyone started out with live rock Right. There was no dry rock. I mean, we all right. bought live rock and we used live rock to set up a tank. And nowadays yeah. everybody starts with dry rock. And I mean, and think about it. We didn't have all these disease problems right. back then that we do now. Right. So, again, yeah. I just feel like it does support the theory that maybe with with live rock, live sand, whether it's bacteria or other microfauna, possibly there are there are natural predators that we're mm -hmm. not getting of these pathogens that you do yeah. get in live rock. because. Yeah, we're missing. Yeah, that's the so, checks I mean, and balances. Yeah, even if somebody I understand from an economic, you know, live rock is a lot more expensive and hard to get, but I would still recommend at least get yourself, you know, two or three, four pieces of live rock and right. use that to seed your your DT before yeah. setting it up. I was about to say, you know, even us, we complained about the price of live rock. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't right. just say, oh, no problem, eight dollars a pound. That sounds fair, and just keep buying it. A lot of yeah. people said, I don't want to spend that kind of money. I want to use something called base rock. And there was a lot of posts about, can I use base rock? And how much live rock do I need with the base rock? Because eventually the base rock will become live. It was the same thing. And somehow we have completely migrated to nothing alive. <laughs> right. And now, doink, it's all there's dead my rock. new fish. Yeah. And here's my coral. And, you know, I, mean, I don't know. It's It seems like we've gone a little too pristine. These aren't museum yep. displays. They're living bios, uh, biospheres and or biotopes and they have lots of needs like you were saying that's I, I agree with you in that regard there probably is something that some systems are lacking or younger systems are lacking mm -hmm. that uh, the more established ones could I hope you find more information on that all right let me throw a question on the screen from Derby City okay. Reefer he says can you ask him if he's a marine biologist or just the ultimate hobbyist um, I'm a self-taught hobbyist that's all I am I'm just a guy that is a like I said, I've, I've I started out when I was five years old. My dad trained me, um, mm -hmm. and so, I was the kid that you know on the weekends I didn't play baseball and football. Well, I did play some football, but anyway, I was going around to all the little local fish stores. I think at one time, when I was growing up, we had something like twelve tanks in the house, just all wow. over the house. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was a pretty big obsession. And then uh, so kind of self-taught, you know, been in the hobby a long time. And then um, like I said, ten years ago. When I was having all these disease problems, I'm like, I, I'm, and you know, it's like a thing. I'm like, I'm not going to let this beat me. I'm going to yeah. figure this out. I mean, I am going to figure this out. I'm not going to let this run me out the hobby. And then it just, I don't know, it just kind of lit a fire inside of me. And I'm like, this is a problem that needs solving and I am going to solve it. I'm, it. It may take me the rest of my life, but I will solve this, you know, and we will, we will get to a point in this hobby where it will be buying saltwater fish will be like bu buying freshwater fish. You're not going to have all these disease problems. You're going to be able to enjoy the hobby again with, right. with, with regards to the fish. 
Nice. All right, next question. Erica asks, can mollies move back and forth between fresh and salt once the quarantine process is done? Yes. I'm assuming they go um, back to fresh, so, they go back to salt, they go back mm -hmm. to fresh? Yeah, you, you can actually, mollies, because they're, they're naturally brackish water fish, so they can move back and forth between um, salt and fresh. Um, the only thing is, is this, and it's, it's probably going to become a problem in time. So when you go to a fish store and you buy freshwater mollies, has to be freshwater mollies, we're assuming that these mollies have never been in a saltwater environment before and thus have no acquired immunity or resistance to saltwater pathogens. Once they've been introduced to saltwater, and they, let's say they do, I call it, they get hit, you know, hit with a disease and you're seeing symptoms. If you were to then convert them back to freshwater, um, then guess what? Now you've got freshwater mollies that actually do have their immune system. It has, it's familiar with saltwater diseases. So what I recommend is if, if your mollies display symptoms of diseases, Go ahead and treat them just like you're going to treat the rest of the fish. And then afterwards, go ahead and move the mollies, you know, after they've been treated into your display tank or into your refugium. They're okay. great. Yeah, they're great fish to have in your tank. They eat algae. Mm -hmm. um, you can put them down in your refugium. I mean, they're just all around good fish. And the other thing I want to say about black mollies, the little black mollies don't do well. But if you get the balloons or the self in black mollies, which are larger, they're mm -hmm. sturdier and they um, handle being in a saltwater environment a lot better. All right, that's good. Next question, Mr. Reef Buster says, when a clown starts to linger in the corner and never gets used to going into the tank, is it a sick of, that it's, is there a sign that it's sick or dying? Um, I mean, just going in the corner, I mean, you know, clownfish are kind of weird and they will kind of display odd behavior. I wouldn't say just laying in a corner is necessarily a sign of a disease, but I would definitely, maybe you want to at least put the molly, I'm sorry, the, the clownfish in an acclimation box so you can get a closer look at it. Mm -hmm. um, like most thing with clownfish is brook. That's that's the, the disease that they're most susceptible to. And what you normally mm -hmm. see is you see that white stringy, like it's like white patches or it, it actually what it is, is their mucus layer actually like sloughing off, like peeling off them. So you want to keep an eye out for that. But just laying in a corner could just be a lazy clownfish. They're also prone to swim bladder infections. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's possible that could be happening. Um, so that's something to watch out for. And usually when a fish has any kind of a swim bladder issue, the um, how they swim is their, their head points down and their tail points up. Right. So that's something else you want to watch out for. All right. We'll come to that one in a minute because I saw that coming up. I'm going to answer this question. <clears throat> uh, variant says... Can you use hydrogen peroxide as a 30-minute dip for corals, such as SPS and LPS, to further reduce chances of VIC, or would that kill the corals? I would say it's going to kill the corals. Bobby, have you been dipping corals in 30 minutes of peroxide? No, the only peroxide, and actually my wife actually kind of developed this process because she had a frag tank and we had some, some uh, nuisance algae issues, and I think what she was doing was uh, one-third hydrogen peroxide to two-thirds salt water for about three minutes, and then you want to rinse it, and you'll have another container which is clean salt water to rinse it off. Yeah. But that was only for um, nuisance algae, like green hair algae, that you're right. you're trying to to kill. Um, to tell you how, so for corals and inverts, to explain this a little bit, for corals and inverts, they carry what's called the tomump stage, which is the cyst stage or egg stage of of parasites. And it's only going to be found on hard surfaces. So any live tissue, like we'll just say we'll just use an SPS. So like on an acro, so there, if, as long as there's live tissue, tomos can't insist upon that. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's like, you know, sometimes you have like a little bleach spot, well, then it could. The, 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 the worst is probably the, uh, the plug, mm -hmm. the coral, the, the plug that the frag yeah. comes in on. I mean, the tomos can definitely insist in that. To tell you how strong tomos are, in order to kill tomos, you have to expose them to 60 ppm chlorine for 24 hours to kill them. Wow. So, you know, just, just based on that and that's actually you can go to the university of florida they they you know they that's where the information is and that's they tested it um you know 24 hours of 60 ppm chlorine no coral dips or anything that we do is going to have any effect on on tomos so the only thing you can really do for those is you can put them in a fishless frag tank um i recommend six weeks at 80.6 degrees fahrenheit because there's a very recent study that tested it and it found that 80.6 degrees Fahrenheit speeds up the life cycle 
in the Tomont will be done releasing free swimmers after six weeks. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have any fish in this frag tank because without the absence of a fish host, the, um, the, the parasite dies out because it doesn't have a hosting life cycle. So you said six weeks, but what if it released on the last day of the sixth week? Now they're free swimming and you grab your coral. Wouldn't you possibly bring it? Or are you saying six weeks is the entire cycle and it's going to get them all? So, so six weeks would be the entire cycle and it would get it all. Now, however, let's just say, okay, let's say you were, you were quarantining a coral and you added it and it's been six weeks. But let's say two weeks previous, you added another coral, which mm -hmm. kind of resets the thing. The well, clock. Yep. it the clock. The tomones are not motile. They can't travel from one place to another. I mean, once they okay. insist upon a surface, they're, they're there. There is always the possibility that there could be an active free swimmer in the water because you added a coral, say, two weeks ago, and it could be actively okay. releasing free swimmers. I feel like an easy solution for that. I think most coral dips would probably kill free swimmers, or right. you could just take it and just take a little bit of DT water pour it over the frag or the invert into a bucket to be discarded that would wash away any free swimmers because they can't they can't really stick they would just be yeah. loosely attached yeah okay i think that um i think a lot of times we want to find blame for when something was wrong in the tank and we try to think of usually the last thing we did and so right. for example i dipped this coral yesterday and now all my fish are dead clearly the coral dip killed my fish i mean that's just the natural progression of our brains where it could have been something happened really bad during the night while you were sleeping <laughs> that right. had nothing to do with that coral but you're, we're blaming it just like when a clam dies and people like the bristle worms killed my clam you know because bristle worms come and clean that up overnight and it's gone i mean it clams die right. really fast and yet people blame the worm and yet the tank had worms the whole time the clam was alive for a good long time but now it just suddenly died overnight so clearly the worms are evil and so i think in that scenario I mean, is it possible some kind of it could come in? One of the things I've told people is that a lot of times when you're buying corals, they're in a fishless system. It's a coral system that they sell mm -hmm. the corals from. There's a display full of fish, and then there's a coral display, and we buy frags from there, and usually the two don't touch. But, I mean, you know, they're using the same utensils, which might reminded me, I wanted to ask you, with all your quarantine and your copper and your this and your that and your other, do you have all separate nets and uh, thermometers? I mean, do you make sure nothing ever touches the display tank? Yep. Yeah, when I was selling um, my fish, my quarantine fish, I had a quarantine room and a, display, um, a retail room. It's just what I called it. I was doing it out of my house, but it's just what I called the rooms. Everything that was in the quarantine room was, was dedicated, even as far as, like, I wouldn't even use a ladder mm -hmm. that I had been using in the quarantine room and the retail room. I mean, just no, no possibility of cross-contamination. Um, anytime I would go from my quarantine room to retail room, I'd take a shower first. I mean, I just, wow. I had to, yeah, <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> All right. I would have yeah. to take a shower. I mean, I, I, I would take no chances whatsoever because yeah. I mean, think about it, you know, wet hands. And I mean, maybe if you just, you know, wash your hands really good, maybe that would kill any free swimmers on your hand. But I just didn't feel like I actually time my day and time my showers around when I had to fool with the quarantine room and the retail yeah. room and, and whatnot. Um, I had my wife to help me too. Sometimes she could, you know, do something in the retail room if I was tied up in the quarantine room. But yeah, you never want to, um, you never want to cross contaminate. Another thing I want to bring up about that, and it's a little bit controversial, is the um, is aerosol transmission. Mm -hmm. So they've done some studies and they've proven that um, aerosol, that, that droplets so let's just say you had a tank with thick in it that droplets can actually transfer by air up to x number of feet now worst 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 case scenario and i want to stress that the when they did this study they were in an out they were as outside they were using high powered fans and they were doing everything possible to make conditions favorable for aerosol transmission and they were able to uh, transfer the dot droplets 10 feet using a high powered fan now, under a more static environment where there was no um, um, wind between the two tanks or flow between the two tanks, they were, I think it was 18 inches. But if you stop and think about it, I mean, you know, we have ceiling fans in our tanks, in our, in our homes. We have yeah. um, of, uh, AC ducts. I mean, there's always some kind of, I mean, very few rooms are going to be static. They're yeah. going to be dynamic. So... I'm not saying I personally observe the 10 foot rule just because I'm paranoid about these things, but I encourage people, you definitely want to put several feet of distance in between your QTs and your DTs 
um, for aerosol transmission. See, all I hear is that you've got a quarantine room and you've got a display room. And between, mm -hmm. you have this small room, the walls wrapped in plastic, and there's this high intensity <laughs> thing that blows you, and your wife is brushing you down like they do when they get rid of the radiation. <laughs> That's the only safe way to do this. We we actually I wanted to move into a house that had a swimming pool that was heavily chlorinated, <laughs> so I could swim in the swimming pool before going from yeah QT room to retail. Yeah, room. but you got to be in at 24 hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me thank Luis and answer his question here. Luis, thank you very much for your super chat. I hope you're still here. If you're not, and I hope you're watching the replay. You asked which quarter-inch router bit you can use. Um, you want the, the shank to be quarter-inch for your router. Freud is a good brand. There's a couple other ones. DeWalt is fine. I, I like the ones that are two or even three blades on the, uh, the shaft. And I like it with a bearing on the end. And if you go with a larger bore, so for example, if it was half inch or three quarter inch even, it seems kind of big and clunky for trimming acrylic, but because it's larger with the rotations, it doesn't get as hot as a narrow bit would get. So Freud or DeWalt are a couple of the brands I use. I've used some other ones. I used one that was green. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. I feel like it was Greenwood or some weird name that I, I tried once. I can tell you those little boxes you buy at Home Depot that have like nine bits in there and you're getting them all for 20 bucks. Don't do it. It's garbage. Those bits work like one time for some wood. Um, and I end up with like nine bits I'll never use again. Just the one because I needed to do one cut and they were out of stock of what I needed. But I use the same bits for months and months and months and I do a lot of acrylic work. So that's my recommendation to you. All right. You see, I suck at all that stuff. I can't do... I can't do DIY. I can't build aquarium stands. I, when I plumb a tank, I have somebody come over and help me. Yeah, see, I don't know how to do any of that. Well, it's like you said, like you said before, you were obsessed with finding out how to solve the problem. And you said, even if I can't figure it out, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to do it. I'm yep. kind of that way. I mean, I was naturally uh, mechanically inclined as a kid. And I remember my dad, you know, we bought a house and there was a grill out there outside on the patio. And, you know, the whole patio, was, I mean, the whole countertop was tile and there was this beautiful grill and we were told it doesn't work. And my dad says, well, I'm enough to hire someone to fix that. And I said, well, let me go take a look at it. And I'm a kid. I mean, I was 12, 13, I don't know, something young. And I went out there and I studied where everything was connected and I fixed it. And he was like, how did you do that? And I was like, well, this piece right here needed to go there. It was really obvious. And it kind of just, I mean, I don't remember what I did, but I solved it. Mm -hmm. And he said, how did you where did you get that from? I'm not. And he says, you must be mechanically inclined. So that's where I get that phrase from. But uh, throughout, you know, my early uh, or my teen years and then later in my 20s, I spent a lot of time doing construction of all kinds. I did roofing. I did foundation work. So from the roof to the ground, I did plumbing remodels. I did sheetrock work. I did some electrical work. I did, you know, I, I pretty much did them all. And I worked with different people and I watched what they did. And, you know, I've got great stories from doing construction <laughs> that has nothing to do with this channel. So I don't waste people's time <laughs> on that. But uh, it was a, it was a lot of fun. It was very hot work, very heavy work, not fun. But I had to pay the bills. I had to take care of, you know, my right. family. Well, it just um, goes to show everyone's got their strengths, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And I think sometimes we expect people to know everything there is about the hobby. But actually, you know, a lot of it is our background. And, I mean, we, we, we need to rely upon one another Right. You know, because like, for example, maybe I know fish is easy, but I mean, I couldn't tell you how to plumb your tank. I mean, that's yeah. not really my forte. So there's people that do know how to do that. Right. And their knowledge is, is just as important as my knowledge. That's my point. It's like, why do I have to learn all this fish disease stuff I don't care about when I can just point them to you? <laughs> right. It just makes me go. happy. And you probably know someone that does great plumbing. You're like, talk to that guy, you know, or gal, talk. you know, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> all right, let's see if we can find another question. And then I want to ask you about the guy who uh, lost a lot of fish over the, I think over, overnight, and he was down to an eel. He didn't know what to do with that eel. I want to get into that with you as well. Okay. Uh, um, I don't remember the details though, but uh, it was in Club Miller's Reef, and uh, something bad happened with his whole system. Give me a second, I'll go look. Why don't you tell a story? <laughs> um... Come up with something that, okay, why don't you talk about I'm just going to put you on screen so I can go dig. Um, why don't you okay. talk about if you have a fish that has Popeye, how you would resolve that? Okay. So, all right, Popeye. So if a fish has Popeye, then it, 
there's two possible causes. So the first possible cause, it could just be an, an injury. It could be eye trauma. I mean, maybe they bump their head, bump their eye into, um, into a rock or something, um, and you're just seeing swelling. Um, so in that case, you really don't necessarily have to use medications because, I mean, you're just dealing with an injury. Um, a lot of times it will self-heal. Obviously, you know, the fish is good water quality. Um, a method I like to use, and it's controversial because you'll hear people say, well, how, why would this work since there's so much magnesium found in, in salt water anyway, and all Epsom salt actually is, is magnesium sulfate. It's possible maybe there's an impurity in the Epsom salt, but this is just anecdotal. Um, I will dose Epsom salt um, when a fish has Popeye, and I dose one tablespoon per five gallons, mm -hmm. and it has worked for me many times. It has helped to ease the swelling. Now, so that that's to treat an eye injury. Now, if the eye starts to turn cloudy, um, that actually could be one of two things. That could be flukes in the eyes. And usually if you look close enough, again, back to using the cell phone with the magnifying glass, you'll kind of like see the little flukes, the white images in, in, in inside the eye, in which case you would need to give the fish a freshwater dip for temporary relief. And then you would need to treat for a prosy to deworm the fish. Um, sometimes fish will get an eye infection, which their, their eye is completely covered, um, um, with like a white haze. And in which case you would need to treat with antibiotics because fish can live with only one eye, but if that infection were to spread to the second eye, um, then it's, it's game over. I mean, fish aren't going to live completely blind. So the meta, the antibiotics I use for eye infections is, uh, erythromycin and minocycline are the two antibiotics I use whenever a fish has an eye infection. Um, I think you dose them every 24 hours for 10 to 14 days. Usually works to clear up the eye infection, depending on the severity. Um, and even if it doesn't fix that eye, depending on the severity, what you're really trying for is you're really wanting to prevent that infection spreading to the second eye, mm -hmm. which you would have to just um, euthanize the fish in most cases if the fish is blind in both eyes. All right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I hope you covered it all. I was busy over here trying to multitask. It's very hard to do research and listen to someone talk. So if I uh, seem to miss part of that, it's because I can't do it. <laughs> I did find the post by the person. So what we had here, I'm going to make this a little bigger. He's going through a series of impossible failures. All the fish are dead. He believes he introduced Brooknella when adding two emerald crabs to the tank. The disease killed the fish in two days for the most. I tried to medicate the tank and lost the clowns a couple days later. I'm thinking he put something in the tank to fight Brooknella, you know, in the display. Um, I only have a snowflake eel left. Uh, the snail's cleaner shrimp, and of course the crab lived. <laughs> Still don't know if the disease can survive off of him or, you know, inside this tank. So he's started a new tank up, and uh, he's wanting to move the eel over, but he wants to know, will the eel get other, pe other uh, fish sick from now on forever. Here is his final question, where it just says, uh, can I put a fish in with the eel in the 55? Will he always have Brooknella that can infect more fish? So eels are very disease resistant because they have a very thick slime coat. Um, they're, and it's, it's a mandarins is another same way. I mean, it's, th it's a fish with a very thick slime coat, very thick mucus layer, and that gives them natural defenses. So most likely the eel isn't infected, but of course the eel could be an asymptomatic carrier. So to be really safe, what I would do is I would take the eel, I would give the eel a 30 minute hydrogen peroxide bath to knock off Brook, since that's what he assumes, you know, uh, took out the tank. And then I would actually put the eel in an observation tank with black mollies, but it will obviously put the black mollies in an acclimation box so the eel can't eat them. And I would observe the eel for 30 days and if he is asymptomatic, the mollies are going to be are going to show um, signs of it. You're going to see brook. You're going to see velvet, and that's going to tell you that the peroxide bath didn't 100% cure the problem. But after 30 days, if the black mollies are clean, then the the eel should be clean, and he can he's safe to go to okay. put in the next tank. Now I do know in the first post he mentioned he had crushed coral. I'm pretty sure crushed coral is not a good choice for an eel. I think they need sand. Right. right? Okay. And then yeah, the, the thing um, I to ask you was. Um, oh, you talked about the peroxide bath. Can you redo the recipe one more time? Like, what's the strength? 
how much of what with how much water, what temperature, what oxygen. <laughs> so, um, so what you do is, I mean, this is, I'm just going to explain how I do it. So I take, I actually bought it at Walmart. I bought like a, a, a thick glass jar. It was like a two gallon jar okay. um, at Walmart. And I, I got one that was thicker just in case I dropped it. I wouldn't shatter it or anything like that. Um, so you would want to um, take salt water. Um, you want to use clean water. You could use it. I mean, if your if your DT is not having diseases, I mean, you could just take it out of your DT, and that water should already be oxygenated. That'd be the easiest thing to do. Take it out of your DT, or if it's uh, like in your vat, you'd want to um, put the water. You want to put the water in the glass bowl. You know, two gallons worth. We'll just say, and you would run want to run a power head or an air stone. It, you know, unless it's been pre oxygenated, you probably want to do it for about an hour to really you know, nice turbulent water, lots of gas exchange to infuse a lot of oxygen um, into it. And then you want to discontinue all oxygen. Um, you may need to run a heater just depending on how, you know, warm or cold you keep you know, your, your, your house. Usually yeah. for 30 minutes, you don't have to have a heater, but you might want to put a small heater in there. Um, and then you want to, what I actually do is take a, a syringe and I, uh, it's, the dosage is 20 milliliters of 3% H2O2 per gallon of water. So in this situation with two gallons, I would be using 40 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. Okay. You want to um, squirt it in below the water line because, again, you at this point, you want to avoid any gas exchange, any oxygenation because okay. you don't want to break the peroxide down. Okay. And then I just take a metal spoon um, and just gently stir it um, to mix the peroxide in. And then you just put the fish in um, 30 minutes. They sometimes will act a little strange. I've noticed sometimes they'll kind of try to suck a little air off the surface, but most fish handle it fine. I mean, you can go on my website. It's been done now hundreds of times okay. on, on various species. 30 minutes, leave them in there, have a little timer set up, take the fish out after 30 minutes, put it in the observation tank or the quarantine tank. What's and the for? Why not plastic or wood? Um, again, because I'm worried about, like, plastic. Um, the I, I like Absorbing. something that's hurt. Okay. And to me, the metal spoon is inert, so I know there's not going to be a chemical reaction between the peroxide and, and the metal spoon, where plastic, mm, I'm not sure about. All right. Thank you. All right. Quirky Lemon, um, I, he asked, do you think a starry blending will have issues with the coral beauty angelfish or vice versa? I don't think blennies and angels have problems in general. I think they can pretty much get along. Uh, you know, the, the blennies should be kind of low in the tank. The uh, uh, angels swim around mid tank level. It's not an upper swimmer. It tends to pick at the rock work everywhere. Uh, have you had mm -hmm. any encounters yourself where these two didn't get along, Bobby? <clears throat> um, yeah, angels and blennies should get along fine. The only thing with blennies, and they're all pretty much this way, is you know when they're small, they will um, kind of pick out like a little hole in a rock. Mm -hmm. And if another fish swims too closely, sometimes they will come out and maybe try to chase the fish away or nip at the fins a little bit. It's usually not like a huge problem. Ironically, because I've quarantined both the small ones and the large ones, like I, I, I've gotten in like starry blennies and Midas blennies that were smaller. And every now and then the wholesaler would send me like this big jumbo starry blenny that was like, you know, what would you say, five, six inches. And the, the bigger ones are so much more chill than the smaller ones for some reason. I don't know if it's because they're older or maybe because they don't feel like they have to be a little bit aggressive because of their right. size. Yeah. Um, so the big ones are great. I mean, I have a client, a former client that, um, I sold a really large starry blunny to, and I mean, she loves them. And, but I have noticed with the smaller ones, sometimes they can be a little bit nippy, um, towards other fish, especially if the fish hangs out too close to, I call it their little hidey hole that they mm -hmm. like to live in. To dodge into. Yeah. Yeah. Dodge into. Yep. I got another question for you here. It's perfect for you. Mr. Berlin method says, how would you deal with a swim bladder issue in a swallowtail angel? It's seven inches long. It's been in the tank for six months. I think the tangs are beating them up, causing this issue. Um, so with it, with, okay. So a lot of times you'll see swim bladder issues with the, those angels that, that genus of angel, because they are a deep water species, mm -hmm. um, depending on how old this fish is, they are deep water species and they're collected in deep water. They're not properly decompressed when they're mm -hmm. brought to the surface mm -hmm. by the collectors. So if you see a, um, a gas bubble forming in the swim bladder, it should be a visible protrusion through the um, um, through the scales. And I want to just make sure I'm giving the right information okay. about. He said that which, his reason for the question is that the angel is mainly swimming with a head toward the surface when he's feeding. 
So he feels like there's a problem with the bladder because at this weird angle, apparently. So if, okay, so let's just say if he's seeing an actual um, gas bubble in the swim bladder, which I mean, it should be very visible, um, then you want to use a 30 gauge insulin syringe to lance the air out of the fish. I mean, literally you would take the fish out, you would lay the fish on a flat surface and you would inject the 30 gauge insulin syringe into the gas bubble. And then you would pull out the air um, to, to, you know, to, to get rid of the, the, uh, the, the gas that's in the bubble. The only problem is sometimes it comes back. Sometimes it solves a problem. Sometimes um, it keeps happening. You have to do it at repeated times. Now, if this is an actual um, swim bladder infection, which is different than a, a gas bubble in the swim bladder, um, there's a couple of options for that. Uh, sometimes giving the fish a 30 minute methylene blue bath um, helps with that. You can also dose, um, I'll just give you the aquarium medication, Seachem Metroplex with Seachem Neoplex um, can help with that. And you can also soak that in the food since it is an internal infection. Um, so that would be the two different things you can do depending upon what's happening. I just picture you, you know, as you've been learning all these things that initially before you went to the syringe method, you just put it over your shoulder and burped it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I know, you know what lymphocystis is, right? The, uh -huh. the viral, the viral nodules they get, you know, back in the old days, my dad would actually, cause we didn't know what that was back in the old days. My dad, I can remember he'd get the fish out and he'd plop it down on a cutting board and use a razor blade to, to scrape off the nodules. And then he would use mercurochrome afterwards. And he never killed the fish that way. I mean, it, it worked. And now we know that it's a virus and with good water quality and vitamin soaked food, it will just, you know, it will go into remission on its own, but yeah. And we've learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Michael. Is there any correlation between copper and lateral line and tanks? Absolutely. Um, most tangs that I treat with copper, even for two weeks, and you know, most people treat with copper for four weeks because they're only using, if you're using just one quarantine tank and you can't do a transfer, you have to treat with copper for four weeks, not two weeks. Um, but the longer almost any fish, especially a tang, is exposed to copper, I've seen it numerous times, they will um, develop um, HLLE. Sometimes it's mild. And it always, for me at least, clears up once I get them out of the copper water into clean water and I start food soaking vitamins and beta glucan always clears up for me. All right. Thank you. Uh, David says, thank you for the super chat, David. Do corals and other filter feeders help remove some free swimming larva from of some of these diseases? So that's I possible. I would count on it. <laughs> well, let me, let, me make, let me read that again. Is, uh, maybe I didn't read that correctly. Do corals and other filter feeders help remove free swimming larvae of some diseases? Could so, they snack on some floating ick, ick or something? I mean, possible. it's theoretically possible. There's nothing, yeah. there's no proof. I mean, I think we talked about this earlier about, well, maybe, you know, corals will eat the, the free swimming stage of, of um, ick and velvet, certain parasites. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible, but there's... There's just no evidence. I mean, there's there's no peer-reviewed studies. There's no scientific evidence that that actually happens that I've, I've run across. And I've been looking actually for quite a while yeah. um, because that kind of goes in line with my little pet theory about bacteria eating parasitomas. I just can't find anything to support it. Yeah, I would think you'd have, I'd have to be a really dense coral uh, reef to pull that off too. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I just don't know if it's a, it's sort of like when somebody says, "Well, I'm going to get such and such to eat all the flatworms in my tank," you know, like some fish. And they think it's going to eat mm -hmm. every flatworm because that's the only thing it'll ever eat. And I say it right. may eat a lot of them, but is it going to destroy the entire population and eliminate them 100%? There is no way. It just never right. happens. There's always some somewhere that it ignored or it learns your food is better and it just stops you know, going that route. So it would be kind of cool if the corals were kind of helping a little bit with the ecosystem, but I don't know. I mean, I think... I'll, I'll tell you this. They did some biopsies of some corals a while back, back in the early uh, 2000s, where they would look at the <laughs> the gut of the coral, and they wanted to see what was in it. And they'd find mm -hmm. like a phytoplankton bubble that the coral couldn't even break it down. It was still intact because it was not for that. That coral couldn't ingest it. It could absorb it, but it couldn't eat it. So it was going to basically poop it out later. And it had some of this and some of that and some detritus. And yeah, is it possible it... it grab some ick or some velvet or something like that. Yeah. It could, it's pregnant. It's opportunistic. It's going to grab whatever it can. 
because it's got feeding tentacles out reaching for anything in the water column. But hoping that they'll destroy it all is very opportunistic and uh, I think very optimistic for someone to believe that. I just don't think that's going to be realistic in the long run. Well, I mean, you have to consider too, like, you know, I mean, like Aiken Velvet, for example, it actually has a life cycle that that it, it, it drops off the fish and, and it, it insists and then there's free swimmers. But there's a number of pathogens that have a direct life cycle, meaning that yeah. they feed, reproduce and live right on the fish. Right. Brook is one of Luke's. So for those, I don't, even if corals or bacteria did damage tomons or eat free swimmers, that's not going to help with fish with those diseases that have a direct life cycle because for the most part, the, the pathogens don't leave the fish. Yeah. So, you know, and then you're down to, well, maybe the cleaner shrimp or something will eat it mm -hmm. off, which is another controversial thing. I mean, how effective are cleaner shrimp at, at right. eating off pathogens? Right, cleaner yeah. shrimp, cleaner wrasses, yeah. All right. right, Dustin wanted to know, is it possible to use peroxide in the reef tank to combat ick? If so, is it 100% effective? So there's there's a lady on my forum who actually is um, has experimented with this, and she's actually taken the lead on what I'm calling in-tank reef-safe peroxide dosing. Um, her name is Jessica, and she's on my forum. Her, her username is Jessica N., and she is really more the expert on this than I am. So what, what she developed was she doesn't know for sure which um, parasite she had in her tank. She thinks maybe she had velvet, maybe she had brook. But what she did was um, just like, you know, some people will dose peroxide in their reef tank to combat nuisance algae. Well, she took that same approach and started, um, well, I think what she's recommending now is she's dosing peroxide three times a day, um, every eight hours, and I think for up to six weeks. And um, also, you know, you can get more elaborate with it. You can uh, use a doser, a dosing pump to, you know, more gradually release it into the water. Um, we've actually done some research and a UV sterilizer actually makes the peroxide more effective, more and increases the efficacy of, of the peroxide. So basically what she did and some other people have done with, and, and some have been successful, some have not, they've actually been dosing peroxide in their tank every eight hours for six weeks. And we have seen in some cases where initially some of the fish do die because they're too heavily infected. But after the six weeks or so of treatment, we're not seeing any recurrence of the diseases. Now, that doesn't prove anything. It's, it's anecdotal. It doesn't prove anything scientifically, but it does look promising um, that, um, that you could actually dose peroxide in your reef tank to help. And it's a reef safe treatment to help with diseases. There's actually a product on the market called, it's peroxide salts. It's the same theory. Um, I forget the name, but there's a, uh, there a product on the market right now. It's pretty much the same thing. It does the same thing. The only difference between this is you can just go to the Walmart and buy the bottle of peroxide for two bucks. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do it yourself and she's got like on my form, she's got it all laid out. She's got like step by step what you do. Um, there's some things, so, so peroxide's two worst enemies is flow and light. So you really want to time your, your in-tank perox peroxide dosing to occur, um, when the lights aren't on because, uh, light quickly breaks down the peroxide. So especially when you dose it at night, it probably is a lot more effective because yeah. it stays in the water longer. And we think that dosing the peroxide in the tank, we think it kills both the free swimmers and it kills the trophons on the fish. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, you didn't say what coral she had in the tank, and I'm gonna assume some of these that she has are pretty sturdy and hardy and can handle it, where maybe more sensitive corals could not. Probably, you know, I don't know. I'd have to look. I think she, I know she has soft corals in the tank. I know she's got leathers, and I believe that she does have some LPS. I can't say, I don't remember she has any acros, which that would obviously be the most sensitive corals yeah. to this. Right. Um, so I can't say about that. And obviously, anytime you dose a chemical in your reef tank, you're taking a chance of losing corals or inverts or something. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you're, but, you know, it's kind of like if you're faced with, which I think was happening in some situations where, okay, do I pull all the fish in quarantine or do I just try this peroxide thing and just accept that maybe I'll lose some corals? Mm, you know, it's kind of a risk reward Kind of yeah, thing. you have to decide what you're willing to risk and what you're willing to just sacrifice. You know, if you're desperate right. and you're like, well, okay, nothing this is going to work. I'm basically, this is my, 
last ditch effort, that's one thing. But uh, if you put this in and it, I don't know, well, I know that Proxy has been used very small amount to fight down a flagellate in an aquarium. And I don't know if the Proxy could affect and destroy the bacteria in the tank. You know, we're talking about affecting ick or something. And it, what about just wiping out the, the good bacteria that's on the rock and in the sand? So it's something to keep well, in we, mind if you're trying to look at doing something like this. You definitely want to know what it's going to do to everything rather than just right. talking about the one problem because there's a lot of other wheels spinning in this project. Well, and there's different dosages too. Like I think the dosage she generally recommends is one milliliter per eight gallons. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some that have done it more, especially with a Fowler, that have done a more aggressive, um, like one milliliter per three gallons. I think I've even seen one person did one milliliter uh, per one gallon. Um, I have no doubt that at, that at the stronger concentration, I'm sure some nitrifying bacteria are killed off, but you know, bacteria are extremely resilient. Mm -hmm. So while mm -hmm. I think it would put a dent in your bacteria populations, I don't think it would wipe out your whole biofilter. Um, just knowing how resilient bacteria is. And the numbers you're describing are pretty much what I use for dinoflagellates. I was using one right. milliliter per 10 gallons, eight days in a row. But it was just once a day. It wasn't three times a day. All right, next question is from Alex. He says, are juvenile fish more prone to disease or less prone than older fish? I would say juvenile fish. Okay, so if we're talking about fish that are collected from the ocean, I would say the juvenile fish are more prone only because being that they've spent less time in the ocean, um, they've had less opportunity to um, to build up a, a natural, like their resistance or immunity. So just kind of like with ourselves, you know, fish or have been in the ocean a long time. And if they've encountered ick or velvet in the past, then they have antibodies. You know, they've developed immunity or resistance to, to these diseases. So if they encounter it in an aquarium, they're more likely to be able to successfully fight it off, you know, via their natural immune system where a juvenile fish doesn't have that experience, if you will. So they would probably be more prone um, to, uh, to diseases. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Ken asked a question we've kind of covered earlier, but we'll throw it up there again. He said, with all that's being said, you know, what about invertebrates possibly carrying in things into the display? How should they be quarantined or treated? So what would you do? So what you want to do, and I've got on my form, it's a whole laid out exactly step by step how to do it. Um, you basically want to set up a um, you want to set up a fishless frag tank is just what I call mine. Um, it doesn't have to be elaborate. I mean, if you want to do a sump and all that, you can. But you know, on mine, I just do like a um, like an HOB filter. Um, I have some cheap Corellia power heads for circulation. You can do a you know eventually a HOB um, skimmer, protein skimmer. Um, you can just use like a cheap LED or maybe a four bulb you know T5 for lighting. Um, and you want to put, and I've got on my form, I've got like a little, um, it's basically like a little diagram I did and it, it, it breaks it down what type of coral or invert it is and how long you should isolate it in, in this fishless environment. Um, and pretty much most corals or inverts should go in there for sometimes less, but we'll just say safe to be safe, um, six weeks. And what that will do is you're basically, um, without the presence of a fish host, you're, you're, you're outlasting the parasites. Yeah. And okay. it renders them inert and then you're safe to put them in your display tank. All right. Variant asks me, what happened to the red spot cardinal fish you had many years ago? Are they still alive? No, they didn't make it. I had them for about six months or so, or they existed for six months, but they dwindled and vanished. I mean, I don't remember. I, I think I found one body. They were very small. They were in the uh, frag system. And then just one day I was like, hey, I haven't seen those things in a while. And then I was like, hey, there's none of them. So that fish didn't quite work out for me. Is that the red light, the red stoplight cardinal fish? No, it was this. It was a glass cardinal fish that had like a red spot. And okay. it was on live aquarium. They were really pretty. And I was like, what are these? And so, of course, I bought, you know, I was going to buy a few. And then somebody says, why would you get a few? Because <laughs> they were so tiny. I mean, they're like your little microscopic mollies. And so I ended up getting six or nine or something and I put them in and they all stayed together and I was feeding every day. And then one day I just realized I hadn't seen them in a while. It's one of those things that yeah. got away from me. Yeah. Red, red stoplight cardinal fish are actually nocturnal. Um, and I don't know if it's the same thing and they, you only really see them at night and it takes them a long time to adjust in an aquarium 
where they actually start learning to come out when the lights are on and eating normally. Cause um, I actually sold some to a client and he like, it's like a year ago. And he just told me like after a year, he's actually starting to see them come out on a more regular basis. And, you know, actually out during daylight hours that they would always just stay hidden behind the rocks. And I actually did a little research on them. They're actually nocturnal fish. Mm -hmm. Like a marine beta would be, you know. Yeah. A so you better fish. feed at night yeah. when they're mm -hmm. out and about. So that's a good thing to know. I don't know that I knew that, and I, I mean, they swam around all day. I didn't see them like hiding all day and then coming out at night. But I don't know. It just that tank kind of got neglected anyway. So I'm sure part of it was my fault, no matter what. All right. So some people are actually saying things that you could do for my tank. So let's throw this on the screen. Jamie says, have you managed to solve Spock's eye problem? And if not, do you think there's a medication you could help, uh, you could use, perhaps Humblefish could help you? So Spock, my Nassau Tang that I've had for 16 years, had a little bit of a cloudy eye, and it's now <coughs> almost mostly cloudy. It's just, it's really bad. Okay. I had a vet here, I don't know, six, eight months ago, it was maybe longer, it was before COVID. And at the time she said, well, it's not inflamed. She, I mean, she took the fish out. She did a light over it, mm -hmm. and she checked it, you know, she did all this stuff. And she said, all I recommend doing is the fish is not irritated, so let's just put it back in the reef and reevaluate in six, six months. So in the meantime, uh, she's right behind me there. There. And the eye on the other side is just like a white ball. So, I mean, I can send you a fresh video, but I have a feeling it's some kind of internal damage. She probably scratched her eye on something initially, and uh, it just got worse and uh so the question jamie's saying is what can you do to help spock's eye <laughs> besides scoop it out with a melon baller mm. so i mean it would it, if if it's just injured um there's really not a whole lot you can do i mean you you could try you know food soaking vitamins to help you know boost the immune system um i mean like i said before you could dose epsom salt um, you could dose Epsom salt to, um, to, to help with the swelling, but you say it's not swollen. It's just basically a white over the eye. Yeah. So it's possible well, she has an eye. infection. Oh, yeah. it's in the eye. I think so. It's I mean, and you know, it could be a cataract, you know, fish mm -hmm. do get cataracts mm -hmm. just like we do. And I mean, she is yeah. 16, you said 16 years old. Yeah. Um, if it's a cataract, I mean, obviously there's, there's nothing you can do. The only thing you could possibly do and this would only help if the eye was actually infected, which if it's been, how long you said it's been going on? Over eight months? Well, it was looked at by a vet at least eight months ago, maybe longer. Okay. And the fish vet actually come here. We caught Spock. Okay. She measured the fish and everything. And um, it's just, it's not good. <laughs> so it, right. it, it just looks like a white bubble. I mean, it just, it you know, the other side is clear. This one is white. You know, just because the, sh the eye is like a bubble. It's not like Popeye. It's just not good like like a white girl if it was i'll send you some video later okay if it you know and the, the thing is you'd have to actually take a biopsy which i know is not easy to do when a fish is out you'd actually have to take a biopsy of it and you'd have to gram stain it to yeah. see if it hit yeah. for gram positive or negative bacteria if it right. was bacterial related um you could do a methylene blue bath which is um you know has uh, antibacterial properties the optimal thing to do would be to put it in a quarantine tank and treat with um, erythromycin and minocycline. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're talking about, um, it's just like, uh, I mean, possibly like a, what did I say before? The, uh, on the eye, the um, cataract on the eye within, yeah, there's nothing obviously you can do for that. Um, I know with dogs, they uh, are now doing cataract surgery, but I don't think they're doing that for fish. <laughs> I know. I kept thinking someone could come in here, like some specialist, and like peel mm -hmm. off the clear gel, scoop out the white, put it back on, it <laughs> heals, boom, I have a great eye again on this fish. It's probably $10,000, even if you found someone that could actually do it, but uh, right. I don't know. So that was one. I've got another fish. It's a, a yellow eye coal with a white tail, and it's got like these weird like holes on its face that... I don't know where they came from, and none of the other fish have it. None of the fish. Just this one, and so I thought maybe it was like battle scars from fighting a fish or something. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple people, even the vet, she said, she saw it, and she thought, I mean, you know, the easiest thing to say, oh, it's HLLE, but there's none on the, all the other tanks. So right. it's just really odd, this one fish, and so I thought, well, maybe it's my crazy high nitrates are really affecting this one fish. And my nitrates were really high. They were somewhere around 80 back then. 
and mm -hmm. I've got them way down from there. They're around 35 or so. But she has these markings, and on my Instagram, I shared a video of my red starfish, and right as I'm filming, that yellow eye coal comes in. You can see the face. It's all messed up. And it's just, it is what she is. And two different people said when they saw the fish, they thought it was a nutrient uh, deficiency and that I should feed way more nori to the tank. And they just mm -hmm. thought if there was nori in the water, because this coal is just not getting enough of what it normally eats. And I was like, okay, because I hadn't been feeding nori much. So I've put in nori quite a bit more. I'm not going to say I'm going nuts with it, but I've put in a lot more. And I don't know that's improving. It's definitely not getting worse. But do these areas that like become a depression in their skull, does it ever fill in again? Is that possible? It depends how deep it is. Um, I mean, I know just HLLE, if the damage isn't too deep, I mean, I've seen fish come back from it and look perfectly normal. Yeah. Um, if the scarring is too deep, then there's always going to be like a, even if it heals somewhat, there's always going to be like a, like a, like a scar there, a basically. <laughs> a dent, yeah. yeah. Right. The only other okay. thing I can think, I mean, it could be a nutritional de deficiency. So the only other thing I could think that could cause something like that, and this is like something that's highly unlikely, but have you ever seen any white stringy poop come out of the fish? No, not once. No. Not okay. Once. Cause no, there's, there's a, there's an internal. It's everywhere. I'm looking for it right now. Of course it's not in front of me. <laughs> There's an internal flagellate, and it's more common in freshwater than saltwater fish. But what it does is it basically starts in the intestines of a fish, and it migrates to other areas of the body. And one of the areas it migrates is the, the sensory pores on the head. And what it does is actually trying to bore out. And you'll see sometimes little, little pits, usually on the face, is where will will go. And yeah. it's caused by an internal parasite, an internal flagellate. All right. But it would produce white stringy feces if it, that was, in fact, what you were dealing yeah, with. Yeah, no, I don't see that in any of my fish ever. All right, so Tattooed Dancer says, In the spirit of keeping healthy fish, how do we train finicky fish onto the food we want them to like? Uh, myself, I just mix all the foods together as I wean them over. So that way there's everything in the water mm -hmm. and they kind of learn it. So I'm not just like suddenly I went from garlic to applesauce. <laughs> you know, so that way they have right. a chance to pick through it and find their favorite stuff. What would you do? And when you, and when you get a new fish, I mean, a lot of times, you, know, you have to understand, look, these fish were not, they were the ocean maybe a week ago and you have to try to, as best you can, replicate their natural diet. So, and you know, fish really like live food. They like something that they can, you know, a new fish, something they can go after. So while like live brine shrimp is not necessarily nutritious, mm -hmm. it is a, a, a food that new fish will eat. Um, I've had really good luck with live black worms. Mm -hmm. um, if you get like a large angel, uh, sometimes, you know, buying like a, you know, like a little neck clam on the half shell or a muzzle or something, they'll eat that. And then kind of once you, um, you, you stimulate their appetite, um, you entice them to eat, then they're more accepting to move on to other foods, like more prepared foods. Um, but yeah, you really have to uh, really baby them in the beginning. Um, and feed them the best you can find, you know, to kind of gradually get them used to, you know, more readily accessible foods. Okay. Speaking of that, um, amino acids, a lot of people are showing a lot of interest in them these days. Is that something you feel helps stimulate appetite in fish, or is that more leaning toward corals, or it doesn't affect fish at all, or they love it, or what do you think? I think it could possibly boost their immune system. The only thing I caution with amino acids is there's been some studies done where amino acids actually can turn copper more toxic. So I would caution if you're treating fish with copper in quarantine, um, look at the, um, the ingredients. I think the only one I found that didn't contain amino acids was cellcone, which is what I use in quarantine. But any food that contains amino acids you probably don't want to use in a quarantine environment where you're using copper because it can turn the copper more toxic. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stefan wants to know, how do you kill a fish the most humane way? So, the well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. The most humane way I feel there's a, um, and it's you can buy it online, it's called MS-222. It's what public aquariums and everything use to, to euthanize the fish. Um, the most... I would say the well the most readily accessible um, thing you can use is clove oil, and if you just give me one second, I can. It's I've got a thread on my uh, okay. forum. I can just pull it up really quick and just kind of give you the rundown of the recipe. Oh, here we go. How to euthanize a fish? Um, 
so to use clove oil and I'll just, I'll read the instructions, but it's also here. Um, so basically you can get clove oil available at many drug stores. You put three drops with a pint, I'm sorry, a half pint of water and shake very well. So the oil and water make a fusion. Otherwise the oil will just float on top of the water and for euthanasia to work, the fish has to get the oil into its system. You add the mixture to the water that the fish is in. One gallon of water should be more than enough and stir it around slowly with your hand. The fish should become very lethargic and sleepy. Once the fish goes belly up, it is asleep, not dead. And then you add three more drops of clove oil and then add another mixture of two to three minutes of oil and water. And the fish feels nothing. It's very peaceful and humane. So it's pretty much three drops per half pint of water kind of puts the fish to sleep. And then another three drops of clove oil. It's sort of like the, the, the death blow, if you will, to, to, you know, um, for the fish and there's on my, um, forum, there's a, there's a whole thread about it and it's got videos and pictures and step-by-step -step directions. Okay. We can add those links later to this uh, video's description. That'll be helpful for some. Um, okay. someone said here when they do bass fishing and they pull them up from really deep water, they use a needle, uh, again, it's for decompression. They call it fission of the fish. Fission? I hadn't heard of that. Hmm. So. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if that's being done like preemptively to, uh, Lance. Yeah, how deep are these bats? Out of the, <laughs> yeah. Cause usually it takes the gas bubble. I mean, what, you know, if you yeah. don't, if, if you don't decompress a fish properly, I mean, the gas bubble, it starts off very, very small, um, in the swim bladder and it can take weeks or I've even seen it take months to develop to the point where it's, it's visible enough to, um, to lance out the air. So yeah, I think I'm not sure about just that. Literally dealing with decompression. It's like, you know, right out of the, right yeah. into the net. All right. A couple of super chats came in. Thank you. Battle OCR and Cindy Coral gal from, I think she's up in Oklahoma. Thank you both. And Mr. Berlin Matthews say, thank you. Humble fish for your help before. So that was good. Let's see. Ashwin says, if you have, if there are two sand burying wrasses in quarantine, do you need two separate bowls of sand? I would say no. I think you can have one container of sand large enough that both fish would fit in and let them find their favorite spot. I don't think you need to have separate beds. Um, <laughs> that's my recommendation. So what I would recommend with that is, um, I mean, yeah, usually like if you use like a, like a large, I don't know, like a glass Pyrex bowl, I mean, should be enough for the sands to burrow in. I've actually found it strange. Some fish in quarantine um, just ignore the sand or they ignore, ignore the bowl. They won't yeah. use the bowl with the sand for some reason. So what I've actually started doing is you can just take some sand and just maybe pile it into one corner of the quarantine tank. So it's more just, you know, there's no glass there. They just go right into it. And actually I've done some studies, um, whereas rock, porous rock, especially absorbs copper, sand does not. Sand absorbs very, very little copper and other medications. So you can actually, if you really want to, um, to make your quarantine tank feel more natural, you can actually put a very thin layer of sand on the bottom of the quarantine tank. It's, it's going to absorb a little bit of the copper, but not enough to, to make much of a difference. You know, yesterday when we were talking about quarantine tanks, you mentioned something about how you recommend every three or four months to do a deep cleaning of that tank. Can you go into that? So... When, when you start out a quarantine tank, the only, everything should be basically sterile except for your, your biofilter. Um, so basically like, you know, most people in quarantine use like a hang on back filter, like aqua clear or Seachem title. And in there you will have um, like a sponge is what most people use. And that harbors the nitrifying bacteria, which processes the ammonia, you know, the, the nitrogen cycle to, to prevent ammonia buildup in your quarantine tank. And as long as that's all you have to start, you're not going to see significant biodegradation of your medications. However, you know, once as a quarantine has been set up longer and longer, bacteria starts to spread to other areas of the tank. It starts to grow, you know, on the surfaces of the pumps and the heaters and on the bottom of the tank. Um, you'll even sometimes even see biofilm will develop, um, you know, sometimes in a quarantine tank. So what you want to do is at a minimum every three or four months you want to completely um you want to do one of two things you either want to take everything outside use bleach completely sterilize the quarantine tank and then you have to reseed it or what you can do is i've got like um on my form it's like a little formula i came up with 
where you basically dose 100 ppm chlorine for 24 hours. And then there's actually um, a product called Chlorout, which they sell at pool supply places, which is safe to use. It removes all the chlorine for you. You then buffer the alkalinity back up because the Chlorout sometimes re um, lowers the alkalinity. And then from there, you're able to um, like, you know, dose nitrifying bacteria. Or what I like to do, what I, that's just the best way to do it. Just look, if, if you're gonna set up a quarantine tank and you're gonna use sponges, we'll just say the AquaClear. Get multiple sponges, buy, they sell them in, on Amazon, like three packs and put a bunch of those in your DT sump and leave them there for months. And then anytime that you need to quarantine a fish, you've got to, you all got to do is pull out that sponge and you've got a yeah, working right. bio filter. Yep. But just right, remember man. every few months, break that quarantine tank down, sterilize it, clean it out or dose chlorine. If you want to go that way, kind of hit the reset button on the bacteria, because the more bacteria that builds up in a quarantine tank, the more you're going to see the medication is going to decompose medications, except for copper. That's the one exception. It doesn't affect copper, but any other medications you use, probably metro antibiotics, it's going to decompose those medications. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Michael wants to know what product are you using to add beta glucan to the fish food? Um, it's actually on Amazon. One second. I can look it up. Um, vitamins and I have to give credit. There's a, a, a member on my forum. Uh, he goes by big G. His name is Gary and he's actually the one that actually did all the, the research and started doing this. Um, it looks like it's pure synergy. I can post a link to it afterwards. It's pure synergy, super pure beta one, three glucan algae extract dietary supplement, 60 capsules. And he's got on here, like it's, it's on my website and it's under vitamins and herbal remedies. He has like a formula um, that he uses a recipe, if you will, to make the fish smoothies using the beta glucan. <laughs> smoothies. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's what he calls it. <laughs> I like that. Yvonne, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Let's see. Uh, and then Yvonne says, what are your opinions on ick management in the display? Have none. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my recommendation. <laughs> we do not want ick in the tank whatsoever. And uh, if you follow some of the things that uh, Bobby's been saying here this in the last couple of hours, you're avoiding ever getting ick in your tank in the first place. If you do see an outbreak, that's a whole other argument. Then it's like, well, now what do you do? And best case is to remove the fish from the tank, set up a hospital tank, and treat those fish, and leave your reef uh, fish list for at least six weeks. It'll probably be more like three months by the time you're done with everything you had to do. But then when you introduce right. your fish, you would then quarantine all brand new fish to make sure that no newcomer can put in the tank. And like I said, we have someone on our in Club Miller's Reef that was saying how they introduced two emerald crabs and now there's a disease in their tank. It's not out of the realm of question that it could happen, but it's really weird and kind of a little suspect to me that that's what happened. I just don't know that a couple of animal crabs could bring in that much plague and kill fish the next day. It's just, I just don't see it, but that's just my gut telling well, me that I'm not a fish disease guy. That's why I have Bobby on. <laughs> it's more likely to happen with, so when, when the, the trophons fall off the fish, they come protomos and they crawl around for 18 hours looking for this hard surface to insist upon to become tomos. And that's how you can get um, fish diseases in your tank through a coral or invert. It's more likely to happen on a non-motile coral or invert than something that's motile, like a like a snail or a crab. I think crabs, crustaceans, it, it's 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 not out of, like you said out of the realm of possibility. It's unlikely. What I tell people, I think the best thing to do with crustaceans, if you're you're having like an emerald crab or a cleaner shrimp or something, put it in your fishless frag tank. Wait for it to molt, so that way, because any tomos would be on the shedded exoskeleton. And then once it molts, um, just then you can move it into your DT because if there were tomounts, it should be on the shedded exoskeleton. It's not going to be on the new exoskeleton. Um, the only thing I tell people is maybe wait a couple of days for the exoskeleton, the new one, to harden before moving the animal into the DT so you don't damage it, you know, with a net. But that's really all you have to do for crustaceans. That's pretty great. <laughs> uh, no limits canine says, how much do lights help marine velvet reproduce? Do lights affect velvet? I believe so. So, deno, so velvet is adenoflagellate. So we know that, you know, adenoflagellate, you know, can use light to obtain energy. And I think there's another direct correlation between 
velvet it seems to be so rampant nowadays and look at the intensive lighting that we're using versus what we were using you know you probably remember vho lights and compact fluorescence from like the 80s where it didn't seem like velvet was so um rampant um so yes most definitely um velvet uses um light as a means of energy and absence so so one of the things a comparison you can make so if free swimmers can survive for up to 48 hours without a fish host. So, I mean, if an ick free swimmer, if a, th if a Theron does not find a fish host within 48 hours, it dies, it starves to death because it didn't find, you know, food. Mm -hmm. um, a velvet free swimmer, which is called a Dinospore, it actually, in, with, with, if it has light, it can survive in a tank for up to 15 days uh, before it needs to find a, a fish host to feed upon. And the reason it can survive longer is because using the, the light in your aquarium to fuel itself so it can find a fish to to feed upon. So yeah, right there proves that, you know, velvet is can use light for energy. All right. Hmm. I have another one here for you. Alfredo asks, what about the use of oxidators as a way of dosing peroxide? Does that mean anything to you? So oxidators, I really don't have a whole lot of experience with them. I can just tell you what I know about how oxidators work. So oxidators, what they do is it, it what the oxidator does is it breaks down the hydrogen peroxide. You do use hydrogen peroxide with an oxidator, but the oxidator breaks down the peroxide, converts it into pure oxygen and infuses more oxygen in, into your aquarium. And the thing is with most of these parasites, so you know, we, we see like ick and velvet and other parasites like on the outside of the fish and we're thinking that's what's killing the fish. Most of the times what's actually killing the fish are the parasites that are inside the gills because literally they're suffocating the fish to death because they're just basically clogging up their gills and the fish is breathing heavy and then the fish, you know, basically dies from, you know, suffocates to death. Mm -hmm. By using an oxidator and infusing more oxygen into the water, you're super saturating the water with oxygen. So that's giving the fish more of a chance to, to be able to breathe while trying to fight off these parasites. And we know that if a fish can, like if, if you can take a fish and you can put the fish with velvet for like, we'll just say a month, and it's, its immune system is able to gain enough familiarity with the pathogen to build up you know, immunity to it, then most likely the fish will be able to live with velvet for the rest of its life because now it has natural acquired immunity so an oxidator is helping the fish do that by um by giving it a more of a fighting chance of surviving the attacks by the parasites by providing more oxygen in the water okay look, what about this we've got fish in the tank <clears throat> i've always said that the best <coughs> excuse me the best approach is to have really fat healthy fish to fight off all kinds of diseases. Hang on a second. As I slowly die. water. <laughs> so is my approach of having a uh, well-fed thick fish a good premise to think they'll stay healthy longer? I mean, I, cause I feel like they have more reserves. They have more built up in their body versus, I mean, I'm not compared to like a thin starving fish. Cause I mean, some fish are thin copper bands, for example. It's very narrow fish, mm -hmm. and you can't <laughs> crying because I was choking it up. Um, <laughs> the question is, what is your ideal fish size wise, or something like that? Do you have a thought process on how to keep them healthy longer? I mean, I think um, I mean I've seen some fish that I I would consider obese, and obviously that's probably not a good thing for them. Just like it's not a good thing for us. I mean, I think uh, a fish that is is thick. You know, you know what I mean? When you can look at them head on, you, you can see the fish is thick. I think that is um, that is a healthy fish. And and that tells me it's a fish that is getting proper nutrition. And again, going back to that proper nutrition is what is um, helping to boost the fish's immune system and boost the gut microbiota, which then, you know, you have a fish that with a very good immune system um, for fighting off pathogens. So. And what I tell people, and I know it's not really practical sometimes, um, you know, depending on your work schedule, but, you know, a lot of people are in a habit of maybe they feed once or twice a day, they feed large meals. I, if you can do it, especially nowadays, a lot of people are working from home because of COVID, feed fish three, four, five times a day, small meals, 
-hmm. you know, maybe just put a very small amount of food in the water yeah. four or five times a day and you're, the fish are eating throughout the day, which helps with their health. And then it more closely emulates their natural environment. Cause you know, in the ocean, fish are eating all day long. They're picking, yeah. that's right. all they do really. They're just looking for a food source. Right. Um, so I really think that helps. I think feeding, I mean, when I quarantine fish, if I could, I would try to feed them four or five times a day as often as I possibly could to, okay. to bolster their immune system. All right. Well, that coupled with what you said before about the oxidator where they can breathe better. So if they're breathing well and they're eating well, that should really help them fight off a lot of situations mm -hmm. that come up versus a, a fish that's not doing either of those things. It, it gives them a fighting chance. I mean, it's, it's basically a comparison between a fish that's being fed well, immune system is being boosted, the, the water is being saturated with more oxygen, which helps them to breathe easier. And yeah. then it's, it's basically, it's a battle of will. Mm -hmm. so basically like these parasites are just going to keep coming they're just going to keep because you know they want to live too so yeah. they're just going to keep feeding on your fish and dropping off but can you um can the fish outlast the parasites can the fish like through feeding and more oxygen in the water can they live and can the fish by itself or you buy the fish more time for their immune system to become more and more familiar with the pathogen it's fighting right. so that they can you know develop a serum proteins that they can release into their mucus layer, which then cause the trophons not, I'm sorry, the, the therons not to be able to attach and become trophons. They become, right. they become more resistant to it. Now, I'll just say it's a dangerous game you're playing because <laughs> yeah. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, um, you know, and I mean, it, it's, and there's other factors that I'm sure come into play that we're not even considering or discussing right now. So, um, and I actually wrote an article. I mean, it's it's called ick, ick management. Yeah, ick management versus ick eradication. I have another one that I did. did this is just simply disease management versus disease eradication. And it kind of weighs the pros and cons of the different methods and the pros and the cons and what you do and what you know what to expect. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Kristen Ann tells us that when she added Sarah snails, and everything died. We think it was marine velvet. We left the tank without fish for two months and everything has been fine ever since. Did we do the right thing? Absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many times um, I have seen stories where people buy snails, they don't quarantine them, and next thing you know, they have velvet. And I mean, again, snails, you know how snails are. I mean, sometimes they're active, sometimes they're just not, you know, they're just immobile. And I think when the snails are immobile, maybe at night, that is when the protomons have more of an opportunity to crawl upon their shell, insist, and now you've got a tomon or multiple tomons on a, on a snail shell. Um, there was Dr. Peter Burgess did a study in the early 90s, and he basically took a lot of different material, and he only did it for ick, but it showed the different types of material um, that where that tomon could insist upon, and shell material was one of the ones that had like a 90% chance of adherence. So most definitely you can get um, um, you can get parasite tomons from snails. It happens all the time. I read, I mean, I get it every day on my forum. I read it all the time. Wow, that's wild. And leaving a family was a very good idea. Yeah, because I mean, then you're, you're starving the parasites out of your tank. Yeah. Heron Aquatic says, uh, what do you think of Bob Goldman's book, Health Feeding Handbook, using chloroquine? <laughs> I'm saying it wrong. Chloroquine dosed gel foods in a display tank to treat ick and velvet using polyfilter to absorb free chloroquine. So I can't say that I've actually read that book. Um, I am I am familiar with, um, there's actually, it was a company called Dr. G's that had an anti-parasitic uh, food out and that's what it was. It was basically chloroquine that was actually um, food soaked. Um, I, I don't, I can't quite wrap my mind around how it works because being that these are external parasites and they're in the water and they're constantly trying to to latch onto the fish and feed, I don't really see how food soaking chloroquine works like dosing it in the water because you know it's active in the water and it's killing the free swimmers. The only thing I could really come up with is possibly the chloroquine then leaches back out of the fish's pores. If, if enough of it is ingested and it leaches back out of their pores and then it basically makes the, the it gets into the mucus layer and it makes the mucus layer toxic to the parasites. Um, you know, I mean, that's just one, I have That'd the same theory. 
Well, I have the same theory about garlic. I think that yeah. maybe the reason garlic works in some cases, I think if, if you've ever been around someone that eats a lot of garlic, that you can smell it on them. It, 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 it actually leaches back out of their pores. Well, possibly with fish, the garlic leaches out of their pores. It, it gets into the mucus coat, into the slime coat, and the parasites find that to be an undesirable host, and they're unable to attach. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, this is just kind of a in general question. Justin is saying, why do my tangs eat euphilia? I just did a water change with the lights turned down a bit. I fed them a lot, and they seem a bit aggressive. The silicon ate a hammer polyp, and the powder brown does as well. It could be that some of the food in the tank is landing in the coral. The coral is trying to eat it, and the fish is going after it. It could be that the fish just doesn't like that coral. It could be that fish loves that coral. <laughs> but uh, it's not a common thing for tangs to eat hammer corals, torch corals, frog spawn. That's kind of unusual. So, I mean, you know, sometimes you will have some random fish that doesn't follow the rules, doesn't read the books we read. And we'll just do some weird thing and you find that you cannot have a certain thing in your tank, at least right now. And maybe six months from now or a year from now, you can put another hammer in the tank and they will never even look at it twice. So it could just be something like that. I, I, I think sometimes that fish that like tangs that eat corals, maybe because they're underfed. You know, tangs have a pretty voracious appetite. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. if you up their feedings to two or three times a day, four times a day, and maybe if you give them nori every day, yeah. And if they have that heat, there'd be less of an enticement to, to nip at your corals, possibly. Because yeah. I've used that strategy with dwarf angels, and I've, I've prevented, I've been able to keep dwarf angels in a reef environment and limit their nipping by feeding them more frequently. Yeah, I like that. Ashwin says, my clownfish pelvic fin is paralyzed. I thought it would heal on its own, but it's been five months and there's no improvement. It swims more like an eel because of it, and it's healthy otherwise. Are there any opinions, humblefish? So with fin damage, fin rot, fin damage, um, if there's a little bit of the fin left, um, I mean, you know, obviously fish can regenerate their fins. Sometimes using an antibiotic or methylene blue bath will kind of help with that because, you know, kills the bacteria. But in cases where the fin, I call it down to the nub, where all you're seeing is, is the skin, the exposed skin, it's not going to grow back. I mean, I've never seen it happen. Um, so unfortunately, Either the fish has to learn to live with the condition or you have to euthanize it. Yeah. Uh, Alessandi, no, Alessio says, I had velvet pop up in my reef from frags. Lost all fish except a yellow wrasse that I can't get out. <laughs> it's fast and avoids the traps. Is there any way to wait it out? So in order to have a successful fallow period, um, the RAS has to be removed because most likely it would be an asymptomatic carrier. That's one of the reasons people like RASs is that you can sometimes have a RAS in a tank where they can velvet. They don't succumb because, you know, they have very, very thick um, slime coats and they're resistant to parasites. But um, one thing I can recommend for catching a RAS is trying a bottle trap. I don't know if you've heard of this where you take the bottle, you cut it, you invert it, um, like, you know, like a two liter bottle or smaller you kind of cut it off, invert it, put it in there, um, stop feeding the tank, and just, you know, maybe put some mice or shrimp or something in the bottle trap. And what happens is um, the rasps, because they're so small, they'll go in there, they'll eat the food, and then they kind of get confused. They usually can't find their way out. Of course, you have to, once you see them in the bottle trap, you need to yank them out quickly. But that's usually the best way to, to get a rasp out of a tank. But obviously, it means you have to stop feeding the tank and just put food in the bottle trap. The other choice to catch a fish out of your tank today is to drain all the water out of the tank and get down to like one inch of water and just start going through and finding that fish. And usually you'll see where it went into the sand and you can basically scoop the sand in a net and find that fish and remove it. It's very invasive, but it's like right. 20 minutes of your life. You drain it, you do it, you get right. it out, you put the water back in and the reef continues. So that's a little bit quicker. It's a little bit more stressful for the fish, but if you're determined, which can happen, <laughs> you can do it. Uh, Raj asked the question, how do you use Prozzi Pro in your treatment? No, it's a little vague. So, mm -hmm. Go ahead. So when I do use Prozzi Pro, I believe from memory the dosage is one teaspoon per 20 gallons. It's like five milliliters. Yeah, one teaspoon per 20 gallons. Um, so when I do use Prozzi Pro, um, I dose uh, one teaspoon per 20 gallons. And the thing is about Prozzi Pro is it only kills the worms. It doesn't kill the eggs. So you have to time a second treatment, usually around six days later, to kill the hatch 
hatchlings before they can mature enough to lay eggs of their own. Um, there's actually on my website and on the forum, there's actually a treatment calculator that actually takes into consideration your, um, your tank's uh, salinity and your temperature because that affects the, the, the worms, that affects their life cycle, and that more accurately predicts when they're going to be laying eggs and the eggs are going to hatch. Um, and, but usually it works out under normal conditions. It's six days later, you have to do a second dosage. And then usually 24 hours after that, your, your fish should be worm free using Prozzi Pro. Thank you. Uh, Matt Greer wants to put a whole bunch of tanks in a 180 gallon tank. So he says he has a NASA and a yellow tang right now, and he wants to add a powder blue, purple, and a coal at the same time. He wants to know about fish aggression. Listen, that sounds like too many tangs so that 180 to me. I had that many tangs in my 280, which is 100 extra gallons plus a giant sump. And now I have five tangs in my 400 gallon tank. So I would suggest you have a NASA and you have a yellow, I would pick one more. And I probably would not get the purple because the purple is the same shape as the yellow, which means conflict. But the coal could be a nice one because it's a workhorse. It actually helps clean the tank and clean the glass and nip at the sand and nip at the rock. Or if you really like the color, the powder blue is beautiful, but it may nip at some corals. So if it was me, I would get the coal tank and stop there. Yeah. The only other thing you could do, I mean, is I like to add tangs last and I like to add them all together. So you literally would have to pull the other two tangs out of the tank if you're going to quarantine the new tanks and then you just kind of add everybody together at the same time at the very end so they're all on equal footing which limits the aggression because nobody has established territories but a lot of times it's difficult to add it is sometimes difficult to add tangs once you have established tanks already in your tank mm -hmm. yeah and if you quarantine the new ones all together that seems to help i mean they kind of seem to form uh what do we call it uh pack mentality uh, well it's sort of a yeah the Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome. So my wife jokes around that what I do with the fish by quarantining them is it becomes Stockholm syndrome because they're they're so just fixated. That's the word on me, and I'm constantly feeding them, and then I don't know. It just they just become so attached to you. And then yeah, and I, I may actually I get to a point a lot of times where I'm able to like hand feed them and all that, you know, because you know. They don't have anything else to focus on but you. They're in quarantine. There's nothing but PVC and bare bottom. So, you know, they get really attached to you. And then it seems to kind of curb their aggression a little bit um, once they get to a DT. All right. Well, thank you, Bobby. I think this was a really interesting topic. I think we got to talk about yes. a lot of things. I could come up with probably 10 more questions, but I should stop. We've been going at this for about two hours. I really appreciate that. Let me uh, switch my hat over to the group here. I want to rec recommend you guys. Today is water test Saturday. Please test your water. Your tank is not fine until you know the numbers. You need to test your alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, salinity, temperature. You want to verify these numbers. And if you have automatic testing machines, still use your test kits to verify that your numbers are correct from your automatic machines. Because it might say all these numbers and you think everything's great, and what if it's not calibrated? What if something's out of whack? What if your pH probe hasn't been cleaned in six months and you're getting a completely different reading than reality? What if your refractometer hasn't been calibrated in a while? You know, kind of get on top of everything, make sure everything's working right. We're heading into the holidays. We're about to be very busy with relatives, even as we're trying to be safe, but there's a lot going on in our lives and we're dealing with a lot of stresses. Can't neglect your tank because as Caitlin says, water tests save fish lives. <laughs> and we want to definitely keep everything alive. So please do test your water today. Post all your results in Club Miller's Reef. Come join us there. We talk all week. Be sure you go to humble.fish to check out his website. And on his website, there's a link to take you right to his forum. You could become a member there. You can post pictures and videos and ask your questions there for further fish disease questions. He's available. And he's now working on doing a YouTube a video every couple of weeks and a zoom video every couple of weeks so he'll be available more and more online besides him answering questions on facebook and elsewhere so I, i'm going to wrap it up here i hope that you guys will be back here next week i was supposed to not have a live stream today because i was going to drive south to my friend's house he was moving a tank today but then both of us got sick last week we got very nervous we ended up being fine and then the uh the person with a tank said nope you've been sick don't come over <laughs> so we didn't get to film the tank move after all so instead we had humble fish on which was a much safer approach anyway <laughs> so i hope you guys have a great week and we will see you uh well i'll see you in another week and you'll find bobby online bye guys bye bye